Ted, why don't uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and oh. give us your background? Uh, Ted Tanner, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, GrowLink. Uh, me and my two other business partners, David Holmes and Stephen Ely, have known each other for about 23 years. Met in Southern California, uh, late 90s. Uh, started a dot com in the dot com boom. It was called Local dot com. Um, so that's what brought us all together. And then from there, about I don't know, five years later, we started a logistics company. We actually drove by our warehouse in Ontario on the way over oh, here. Nice. So I was still in Marcus. I'm like, that used to be our building. <laughs> um, and Pitney Bowes, which is right up the street, yep. is who acquired uh, At Last Fulfillment. Um, there's a reason I'm telling you all this. <laughs> and then uh, we sold that company in 2012, right? And we're living in Denver. And so that was right when cannabis, commercial cannabis started popping up. Uh, 2015 ish, somewhere right around there, and I started touring. I wanted I wanted in the industry somehow, even though that's not my background. My background sales, marketing, business development. Mm -hmm. um, but the industry was fascinating, and so I had some friends that were opening up some cultivation in Colorado, and I was visiting these facilities. And at the time, it was literally a thermostat on the wall for HVAC. Uh, Toro timer from Home Depot running valves if they weren't hand watering and hand mixing nutrients. And that was kind of the aha moment. Um, I'm like, wow. And IoT was just coming out, the cloud, all of these like new technologies were coming out. And so um, we started a company, originally it was Hydropods, and, uh, and it was retail controllers, so Wi Fi controllers with Wi Fi plugs, kind of smart home stuff. Uh, that was the start of, of, of GrowLink. Um, and so we brought a modern platform to, to ag really, uh, even across outside of cannabis. And so native iOS and Android apps, a web app, pushing data to the cloud, um, just making it super easy, like su really intuitive, easy to use product. I think it was even before or right around when Nest thermostat came out. Cause I know we pulled a lot of ideas <laughs> or design yeah. cues off of the, uh, Nest thermostat. So that's what it was. In the beginning, it was just monitoring and control. Uh, as we got into this, uh, we had a hard time creating a company. We don't have any outside funding, no debt. It's all organic growth. And it was hard to make money in retail at that time with this product. I think we were early to market. Uh, and so we, we saw that a couple large commercial scale grows were using our little wireless plugs and stuff. And, and, uh, we realized that that was probably the market where we could be successful at. And so we took another stab at it. We brought everything back to, um, UL panels, built a industrial IOT controller. So really industrialized, uh, the original product uh, that we created and started selling and started selling it in the panel and having everything hardwired. And that's really when things took off. That was the, I guess the product market fit moment is uh having these control panels with everything connected to it and we saw some i always say we kind of grew up in the industry with everybody and i think the cannabis industry has been really good to us uh at least the openness to try something right uh we're controlling you know millions of dollars with the crop so these people took a leap of faith in working with us yeah, I think um, your strength seems in, in a, and you guys, it seems like your team's really strong in software. Yeah. Right. You're really strong with software, but then you have the know with all to bring in people like Marcus, like that are, you know, in, traditional cultivators, you know, to give feedback on, on your software. Is that? No, you're accurate? right. I mean, I yeah. always say we're a software company that sells a lot of hardware. Yeah, um, yeah. And a couple of years back, we made the decision to to not manufacture as much hardware. So we found contract manufacturers that make our core controller. You know, we didn't design that. Um, we find sensor manufacturers to to work with us in designing and manufacturing the sensors. Because uh, all the original stuff was, I mean, we literally were assembling all the circuit boards and everything. And even the the new Connect controller, which we'll talk about a little bit, brings us back to doing all the design and assembly ourselves um, just because there wasn't anything out in the market that we could find or yeah. uh, for that. And so, yeah, definitely software strong, bring people in like Marcus, as well as 
we sell direct to the end user. So we don't work through retailers or partners currently. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. That, that might be changing, uh, which has allowed us to have these direct relationships with our customers. And so that constant feedback loop and, and just the industry as a whole, the, I feel like we have these incredible relationships and people are extremely helpful, right? They're like, yeah. oh, we'd love to see it do this, this, and this. And that's really what drives our product roadmap. Uh, we call it our insiders program. And this is just a group of core customers that, that participate in product testing. Uh, they sit at the table when we're discussing what's next. What's, what are we going to tackle this quarter? Um, so really our customers drive what we're working on. Yeah. No, I Which know is, uh, you, you work with Mitt, Mitt Master, right, mm -hmm. Dylan? How's that? How's that relationship? It, it's good. I was going to get into that a little later. He, no, he, it's he okay. actually drove uh, a lot of changes that we made between our, our first program and our, our second crop steering program. Nice. So it wasn't like exactly what he's talking about here. If it wasn't for that guy, you know, we would have been missing a couple, I think, key features. Yeah. So we're yeah. super grateful for that. That's awesome. That's really cool. Marcus, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and, and what, your, what your role is at Growlink? Yeah, yeah. Um, Marcus, um, I am on the, I've done a lot of things at Growlink. You know, I was hired on as a tech originally, but I've kind of moved through a bunch of different roles, you know, because we are a small company. You know, we all work together and, and kind of do everything, so I kind of go where it's needed. But now I'm uh, on the product, product team, product dev team. So like you was saying, like with the insiders group, you know, I, I'm the one interfacing with a lot of our customers collecting their feedback, you know, talking over some things and bringing that back to the uh, engineering team. Background, uh, I'm from the South, you know, from Florida. And, you know, weed's always been a pretty large part of my life since I was young. But being from down there, I ended up getting in a little trouble. And so I, I got out of there as soon as I could. And I was fortunate that I had uh, some good friends who had farms out in Colorado in the traditional market. So, you know, I got up there as soon as I could and kind of went with it, you know, and just ran those farms for a bit. And uh, at least until like 2012, <laughs> when we got priced out, you know, it became uh, came to a point where the risk wasn't worth the reward anymore. So I then got into, you know, electrical and construction for a little bit, but I, you know, I still, I kind of missed, you know, the, the culture of weed. And so I... Uh, I decided to try to like look back and get into it. And then I saw a listing um, from Hydro, it was Growlink at the time, yeah, from Growlink where they were looking for a tech who had electrical experience and growing knowledge. It like, came full circle. Yeah, exactly. I was like, huh, wow, that's cool. And so, so yeah, I've just kind of been with them ever since. What part of Florida are you from? Uh, Southwest. So like the Fort Myers, Naples area. And when, what year did you start growing out there? Uh... Like freshman in high school, <laughs> so it had to have been like 2006, 2005. Yeah, Florida in 2006 was heavy. It was scary. Yeah, real scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when did you move to Denver, or when did you move to Colorado? Um, I think I graduated in like 2012 or something like that. Yeah. So or no, no, I'm sorry. Even no, Florida, Florida uh, back then, even in 2012, was 12 was scary. Yeah, I was actually out there a little bit before that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. there was a reason I left. So yeah. I was like, this is not going to end well. Yeah. Um, Were you doing mostly outdoor or indoor cultivation? In Colorado? No, in Florida. Florida's out, uh, closet and outdoor. Closet. How did, how did it grow outdoor with the humidity? I always hear like mixed stuff on that. Uh, if it got through until the end of harvest before <laughs> someone found it. <laughs> really like that. <laughs> yeah, they were pretty quick on it. Um, uh, you just chop it a little early, you know, I mean, we weren't, I was young. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just practicing then. So I didn't have big buds, you know, I didn't have to worry too much about like rot or anything like that. So it was just bag seed. Yeah. So. No, nice. Sean, what up? How we doing? You've been busy, huh? Yeah. Been on the road. A lot of commissionings this summer. Where'd you just come from? I knew you flew from an appointment. Uh, I was in Ohio for the last couple of days, actually on a Growlink job uh, out there in Cleveland. Nice. It's a pretty good sized facility. I think it's like 800 lights, something like that. Uh, all core controllers from Growlink, Growlink fertigation skid with Anderson injectors. Uh, beautiful spot. 
Nice. How's your interaction, Demeter Designs, with Growing? Like, how do you guys work together and what are the benefits of, of the two combinations? It's actually a really cool relationship. It's more like a, <clears throat> like a friendship, partnership style thing. Uh, I work with Colton quite a bit on your guys' team. Uh, and the two of us, when we see opportunities for each other, whether I have a client who doesn't know where they need to go, needs help with what type of fertigation system they want to use, or if they need climate controls or substrate monitoring, I kind of find the best fit for them in the industry, whether it's GrowLink or someone else. Um, we're kind of agnostic to who we use. It's just what makes the most sense for the customer. And if they're looking for that all-in-one solution, uh, they want fertigation, substrate, and climate, it's kind of an easy sell to go to GrowLink. Um, so I'll make the introduction to Colton uh, and then clients take it over. They do a demo, goes through pricing. If it all works out well, then we go ahead and do the design with the GrowLink platform. Um, and it's kind of a seamless relationship because knowing everybody on the GrowLink team, we can share P&ID drawings way early on in the design process, which helps with their quoting so that they're accurate, accurately building their panels for the customer. Um, yeah. And then if on the other side of things, if Colton has somebody that is trying to buy a system that has no direction, or they're just trying to use a general plumber that doesn't know anything about cannabis irrigation, he refers them over to me. Uh, and I fill that gap on my, on my side. How about, how about for the growing side? What is, what do you see the benefits in using like a partner like Demeter Designs? Does it, does it make your guys' job easier? Oh yeah. It's also <clears throat> really comes down to the, to the end customer and the experience they have working with, you know, both companies. I mean, we're, we're a little obsessed with customer experience. Yeah. And, and so when you find a good partner and these aren't paid partnerships, I mean, these are, this is just, Hey, you guys do incredibly good work and we want to refer people to you because they're going to have an, 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 a great experience. And then, uh, like you mentioned, Sean, having, having the drawings and the layout and, and everything, helps us engineer a solution so much easier than working directly with a plumber that may not have a plan. Yeah. It makes your guys' jobs a lot easier. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day for <clears throat> Demeter, GrowLink and Athena, I mean, the end of the day, having a successful customer is what drives our success. 100%. Now, happy customer. Yeah. <laughs> a, a successful <laughs> customer is a happy customer. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I think it's important why we talk about why we do these podcasts like this. You guys did not pay us to be here. Um, and we, we just do this because we believe in what you guys are doing, you know, with knowledge base, um, knowledge to the, to the customer base. I think it's really important what you guys are doing with systems. Um, and when Sean heard that we were going to be talking uh, he called me and was like, look, like they are doing some industry changing stuff. Um, you should, I want to be on the podcast because I understand Thanks. what they're doing. Um, and once he broke it all down, I, I was naive to it because all, a lot of the stuff that you're doing right now is new, right? I mean, crop steering 2.0 is new. Your guys' controller is new. Doing stuff for the hobby grower at 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 home is new. Um, make it more accessible to guys that are growing in the basement bedrooms, basements, and garages. I think is that that really intrigues me because that's I think that's all of our background, right? Um, so when I heard about all that and Sean really broke it down, I was like, dude, come on, like let's talk together because I think it'll be a way more, you know. Um, It'd be a better podcast. So no, I'm stoked to have you guys here and and stoked to get into like what you guys are doing and it'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. I th I thought it'd be important to kind of give a foundation of irrigation strategy before we like jump into, you know, some of the stuff that you, you guys are working on. Um, and I wanted to direct a lot of the questions towards Marcus. Um, what like just on a baseline, what is crop steering? Yeah, so crop steering is a term that everyone's used now for essentially, you know, just a different style of growing, you know, where it's a bit of an overplayed term in my opinion. <laughs> but, um, but basically crop steering is manipulating environmental stresses and irrigation stresses um, in order to get a, an output that you want from the plant. Um, there's several ways to go about it. You know, at the end of the day, though, it's just managing those stresses 
um, for the desired outcome. Um, do we want to go into like specifics here? Or? I mean, yeah, I mean, go, go. It's, we're not in a rush. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> How much time you got? <laughs> yeah. So basically, the, the way I see crop steering in my mind is, you know, you have vegetative steering and you have generative steering. These are like the terms that industry seems to be using as a whole. Um, both kind of do different things, you know. Um, in my opinion, though, I think the. Oh, shit, sorry. Can we? No, can, you can. can we, you can. Nah. We can just keep going. Okay. Like, yeah. yeah. No, so let's let's go the, the difference between. <laughs> so, let's go. Let's give the foundation. Like, what's the difference between vegetative and generative? I think that's really good. Like, what what are the characteristics that the plant the plant you're going to see in the plant versus vegetative versus generative? Okay. I got a little messed up because I was thinking like uh, basically in my opinion, like with crop steering, um, we're trying to steer, we're trying to grow a healthy plant always, right? Where crop steering comes in is that we are introducing stresses at certain times to get a desired effect that is different than optimal growth for that period. So like you don't want to ever just steer, you know, generatively the whole time or you're going to have a very stressed, stressed out plant. It can herm. You're not going to have good results. But then again, you could steer vegetatively the whole time and it would be a very healthy plant. You know, it might be a little leafy, but it's going to be a healthy plant just like we used to always go for, you know, back in the day. But you're not going to get that expression out of it like you would if you stress it. Right? Exactly. Get that color, the, the trichomes, like exactly. all those things that we're looking for in cannabis. Exactly. So you can, you can kind of say like how we used to water our plants. Say most of us, you know, in the garage were, were hand watering, right? When mm -hmm. we first started, that's more a vegetative, Correct. you know, irrigation strategy. Correct. So if you think about it like this, like vegetative steering is like the equivalent of in nature, if it was just in, a, in an oasis environment, you know, it's just super healthy, super happy. It's got no drought stress. It's not getting, you know, the ground's not salty. You know, it's, it's got everything it needs as a balanced nutrition, perfect environment, perfect VPD. That's vegetative steering. That's what we're going for. Generative steering, on the other hand, is we're allowing certain stresses to happen because we found in nature, just from through observance and testing, that it's like, you know, when there's a drought, the plant has to respond to that. It releases hormones, it releases auxins. Like it's going to make a change happen within the plant to adapt to that. Um, the same thing with like a high salinity environment as well. It's another stress that happens with plants in nature. So what we're doing is bringing nature into the grow room, you know, where, cause we have control now, you know, we're able to control the, the valves, you know, when they're turning on and off, we're able to dial in an environment perfectly. Like I can set exactly what my VPD is, you know, I can put exactly what my light level is, my CO2, all of that, everything is stable. Um, so in an environment like that, where we can make one half of growing the plant, you know, stable. Now we can introduce stresses when we want to, um, to get those, those hormones, you know, those metabolic changes. And the way I see it is like, like I was looking through your guide here, you know, it's, this is exactly what we do as well. You know, you have a strategy where you're steering vegetative through, honestly, if you look at it, you're steering vegetative through most of the flower, through most of the plants growth cycle in general, not just in flowering, you know? Um, but there's like, two periods, there's only two short periods when we do go generative. And again, it's only because we're looking for those desired results. You know, um, we're giving up growth during that time, in my opinion, uh, where like if it, the beginning of stretch, you know, the beginning of flower, if we steered vegetatively, the plant's going to be healthy, it's going to rip, you know, it's going to do great. But rather than having certain growth characteristics occur during that time by steering vegetatively, which would be like stem and stalk growth, extra leaves putting on, you know, stuff like that. We would rather, we're going for something specific during that time. We're going for like a bud set, you know, we want, that's what's going to prime for the rest of the grow. And we want that to be at, you know, at maximum capacity. And so how do we do that? You know, we looked at, okay, these specific hormones and these auxins are, are what is responsible for that happening. So how do we get that to, to occur? And that's why we're steering generative at that time. It's like putting that stress on the plant, you know, raising the VPD up, you know, causing it to be like in a, a drought stress, increasing the salinity. Those are all things that the plant doesn't want. 
And so it thinks it's like, oh shit, I'm, I could die here, you know, uh, this is not good. And so it releases those hormones and then we get the desired effect at the sacrifice of the rapid growth that we normally would have gotten if we just steered vegetatively. Um, visually, visually, what are those effects visually on, on the plant that they'll see when they do switch to more generative? Um, well, it, so it, it basically like it's, it depends on like what the time frame is of the plant that you're of when you're doing it. And so in that specific time, go the first, the first, um, the first time you'll, you'll. So yeah, the first time is going to be, you know, week one of flower during stretch. The same things are going to happen regardless if I'm steering vegetative or generative. You know, the plant is doing its thing regardless. It's going to be switching its hormone cycle up thanks to the light. It's going to be, you know, starting to produce pre-flowers at that point um, and getting ready to, to flower um, as part of its, you know, rep, uh, reproducing strategy um, and staying alive as a plant. Um, and so during that time, basically it's going to, us giving these stresses are going to just make that happen more intensely, faster, because it's releasing those hormones anyway. But what we're doing is, is we're scaring the plant into thinking, I might not get a full cycle. I might not have the full time to do this. So therefore I'm going to, speed up those hormone productions now to get more bud sets happening, to get, you know, more pre-flowers so that I increase my chances of pollination so that I don't, you know, so that I can pollinate, make seeds and continue on. Um, that's great. No, that's <laughs> perfect. I've never heard it like that, but that makes a lot of sense. In a nutshell, do you want to break down for us, like during weeks one through whatever weeks, week one through, or this week through this week, when you're going vegetative and generative and, yeah. So on and so forth. Just in a general nutshell, so people understand what weeks you're typically steering those different strategies. Yeah. So vegetative um, is pretty, like I said, it's going to be your the main thing that's going to happen throughout most of the cycle. Um, so all of edge. All of edge. Yeah. Sometimes people will start switching a little bit early when they're getting ready, like a week before they go to flip. Um, it's not necessary though, you know. So you're steering veg most of the time because the whole thing is we know. Again, we're, we can't forget just because we're crop steering, we can't forget like what we what we knew before crop steering was, you know, a, a healthy veg and leads to a healthy flower. You know, we want the plants to be ripping when we transition because that's going to cause everything else to happen that much better. So you're steering when you steer vegetatively, your plants are healthy, they're happy. Um, so that's what we're trying to do through veg. And then the moment we switch into flower, we the hormone change that's happening naturally occurring in the plant is to switch its switch from, you know, ripping with leaf growth and, and elongating stems and building that stem structure to support all of this weight. Now it's focusing on, okay, let's, let's populate the pre-flowers at this point, you know? And, um, so sorry, what was <laughs> week by week? Yeah. Week by week. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Howard, Howard <laughs> generative and vegetative. Yeah. So basically when you steer, you start steering generatively at that point. Yeah. Um, and that's just going to allow the natural process that's already happening to just happen faster and, you know, and better, you know, like instead of it producing just one here, one there, it's going to start producing a lot more. They'll be typically bigger. A lot of times they'll be tighter stacked on there, but again, that's, that's really strain dependent. Um, there are ways that you can manipulate, you know, your environment as well in this because crop steering is 50% irrigation and 50% environment. Um, you know, you could change up your day-night temp differential to, to control stretch during that point as well. Um, but really, you know, we're using generative steering for those first three weeks, you know, until stretch is over uh, to get that done. And then from week four through six, typically, is bulking. You know, we're going back to veg. You know, now that the, the plants have their, their bud sites created, um, now we need to nourish them. There's no sense stressing them anymore at that point. We want to say, all right, you've done the job that we wanted you to do. Now let's get you, let's get you nourished. Let's bulk. Let's pack on the weight now. Um, and then this one's kind of up in the air. A lot of people experiment with this. And bulking's after week three to yeah, two week. Es essentially once stretch is done. Okay. So usually it's like day 21, but, you know, it can always. So after, after week three of flower, you're going to go vegetatively the rest of the flower cycle, or is there another time that you go generatively? I'm going to do vegetatively up until about week seven, week okay. eight, somewhere around there, depending on how long the strain's going, um, where you kind of go half generative again. 
in my opinion. So like you, you want to start introducing drought stress again, but you don't really need to necessarily stack the EC at that point. Um, you can, um, but really all you're doing there is you're once again using that stress to amplify the, the hormones and auxins that are being released naturally by the plant at that time period. So even without steering generatively, the plant is still um, going to be releasing those hormones so it can ripen and finish up. Um, so what we're doing now is we're just amplifying that stress so that it can do it faster. So faster, better, stronger, you know, all that. Now, now week, week one of flower to week three of flower, you see shorter plants, more bud sites, induced flowering, right? Those are the main benefits. Now, if we're going starting week seven and eight and we're, we did vegetatively for, you know, four, five, six, and then seven, eight, or based on the, the cultivar and, and how many weeks it's going to flower, you go back to generatively, what, what are you looking for on the ripening on the flower? Is it aroma, taste, like what, it, what's the goal? Everything, you know, it's, it's, again, it, it's just extenuating like exactly what you would be going for anyway. All, what a lot of people report is that it just happens a little bit faster. So they might finish a strain in seven weeks versus eight. You know, so you're going for the same things. You're looking for terpene production. You're looking for, you know, the trichome heads will will turn quicker, they found as well, because it's, again, when you introduce stress, the plant thinks it's dying. That's essentially what it is, is the plant thinks it's dying and it's responding to it to finish up, if, well, you know, before that happens. So usually seeing a higher increase in THC and terpenes when you're doing generatively on your finish? Yeah, a lot of people see that because you're not, basically it's trying to finish faster, but you're actually still, you still have the same amount of time that you can push it. So you're just, you know, you have more time to stack in there. You have more time to increase terpene production, more time to to um, increase THC production. So you're well. seeing a, a, a greater increase in quality when you're, yeah. when you're steering generatively the last few weeks. Correct. Yeah. No, that's, right. that's really cool. You know, we did this... Um, <clears throat> crop steering kind of guide, irrigation, um, precision irrigation guide, and main things between vegetative and generative P1. I mean, we should probably go over P1, P2, P3 before we go into this. Can you break down what what that means, P1, P2, P3? Yeah, so P1, P2, P3, we're looking specifically at the irrigation side of crop steering. Um, and it basically what that is is you take a 24-hour period and you're splitting it up into certain phases, you know, of how you're going to irrigate. So you have P1, phase one. That basically is going to be the, we call it the ramp up phase. Um, and that's where your substrate has, is dried out from the previous day and you're resaturating it again up to field capacity at this point. Um, so it's like your first water of the day. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And we usually like to structure that in multiple shots. Um, because if you just did like one big shot on a dry substrate, you're going to have a lot of channeling that can occur. We don't want that. So we try to give it smaller shots, wait a little bit, give it another small shot, wait a little bit, give it another small shot. And that allows for even saturation to occur. Now P2, phase two. Oh yeah. P2 is our maintenance phase. Um, and that's, again, sometimes we use it, sometimes we don't, but when we need to, that is going to maintain the substrate at its field capacity um, until, we, until we're done watering for the day. So sometimes P2 can be short, depending on what kind of dry back we're trying to get, or it can go all the way up until lights off, you know. And during that time, we can adjust the, the shot sizes and the dry back amounts. Typically, we like to equal those two together. So if you have like a 3% shot, you're going to have a 3% dry back because, again, it's the maintenance phase. We're trying to maintain that field capacity. What, what is field capacity? So fuel capacity is the maximum saturation point of your substrate. Um, so like you've, you've saturated it and it's not going to get any wetter. You know, every space inside of it, that, every pore spot inside of it that could hold water is filled and everything now is just going to be runoff that's occurring. Okay, so, so P1, based on multiple shot size, uh, multiple shots, gets you to field capacity. Correct. And then P2 is field capacity with dry back, then back to field capacity? Correct. So then that's maintaining your 
you know, pretty much where you want to be in your substrate. That's allow yeah, correct that, and it's allowing you to also push runoff in a controlled way. Okay. So when you're at field capacity, that's the only way you're really pushing runoff is you're already maximally saturated. Everything you're putting in now is pushing something out. And then you're typically breaking field capacity at the end of your P1 shots if you're looking for a reset on the medium for the day, right? If your ECs are starting to climb pretty heavy from your initial dryback. I know personally I like to, at the end of my P1 shots, kind of break field saturation to bring that EC back in check and then maintain it throughout the day. Yeah, yeah. That, that's A lot of people like to call that a, just a flush. And with our new program, we can go into, but that's essentially another phase we've added in as well. So directly after fuel capacity, we have another separate irrigation event that you can program where it could be five minutes, it could be 20 minutes, whatever it is, but it's exactly like you said, you're breaking that fuel capacity barrier. So while the probes won't read anything higher, you're still pushing that water through and it's resetting your, your substrate. You know, we have some customers though that do that through the P2, right? Like yeah. Every <laughs> shot, they overshoot a little bit throughout the P2. To also if they're bring not down trying the to stack, they're just trying to maintain a very consistent EC. They, they just break every single time. Right. Yeah. You Versus, can, you know, one long shot right, right. after P1. Yeah, you can, that's how we used to do it, like with our original yeah. program. Um, you can maintain your substrate EC via your, your maintenance shots. It's, that would be more of a vegetative it could strategy. Be, it could be both. Oh, it could. Yeah. Based so, on how high your ECs are, how low your drybacks are. Correct. So essentially, like whatever that period is of your P2, it doesn't matter, but we kind of also introduce a little bit of like a generative vegetative in there um, where if you are trying to keep your EC low, you know, say, it, say it's a, uh, or say your EC is high or higher than you would like and you want to bring it down a little bit and maintain it being low we're going to steer more vegetatively there, which means we're going to have a smaller dryback in between our shots. And what that's going to do is, it's, again, we're at field capacity. Say we, instead of having, let's say, a 4% dryback between our next shot, we're going to do a 1% dryback. And so it's not giving it very much time to dry back, and then you're giving it another shot. So it's closer to field capacity, and it's going to keep pushing more runoff. So it's essentially a drawn-out flush at that point. And then same thing, whereas if I want to stack EC... Um, and I don't have the ability to flush, then I can make that dry back 6%, you know, and that's now a long time that it's taking it away from, it's 6% difference from fuel capacity. And so that's one less event that it's, it's running off for, so for starters, you have less irrigation events. And then the irrigation events that you do have, have to go further to bring it back to fuel capacity, then you know, and then push runoff. So it's, it's, you're getting much less runoff during that point and your EC will slowly start to climb yeah. by doing that. So we went over P1 phase one. That's the first watering of the day that brings you to field capacity. We went over phase two, which is maintaining, um, your irrigation throughout the day. What is, what is P3? What is phase three? The so phase three is where we stop irrigating. That's going to be our dry back. Um, that, it's essentially what a lot of crop, crop steering is based around. Um, so that's the number that we manipulate based on what kind of stresses we're trying to in, 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 you know, induce. Um, what's, what's the time frame for P3? P3 can start, it's, it starts immediately after your last irrigation event of P2. So a lot of times that's still during lights on. Um, you know, especially when we're steering generatively, it's going to be, you're going to have your P2 shots that are going to occur up until a certain point. And then from right then at that point, the last irrigation event of the day, that's when P3 begins. And it's going to last all throughout the night until the next morning. Is there any irrigation events in P3? No. So P3 is no irrigation events, just a pure dry back from your last P2 irrigation event till your P1. So it's just drying back the whole night. Okay. And your the direct or the amount of intervals on uh, your P2 are going to help uh, determine your P3 dryback, right? Like if you're pushing too many P2 events, you're not going to get that achieved dryback potentially, especially earlier on when the root zone development isn't as high, uh, like after a fresh transplant, you're not going to push as many P2s, if any P2s on a newly transplanted room. Maybe your P1s will get you up to field capacity and then to achieve that 
that dry back we're looking for, you might not have any P2s at all until you start developing a root zone and the plants actually start drinking. Okay. Right? And then as they as that root zone starts developing, the plants get bigger and bigger and they're uptaking more water. We're going to need to increase that number of P2 shots in order to not over dry back during our P3 or to achieve that dry back during the P3, right? Yeah. So we can say like back in the garage days of when we were hand watering our plants, we were doing a P1 and then immediately went into a P3. Exactly. Skip yeah. the P2. Yeah. There was Much. no P2 events, right? Uh, well, well, maybe sometimes. You might have, like yeah. That midday well, watering, right? Oh, if you did a midday water, right. yeah. then you'd have a P2 event. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. call it that, I, mean, I guess. Kinda, that's, I mean, <laughs> simplify it for, yeah. for guys that are hand watering, which is, I know a lot of guys that are hand watering that do really, really great. I mean, Mile High Dave is one of them. He just does one, you know, big P1. Um, and then automatically goes into P3 and then redoes it. So what do you usually like to run on EC with Athena? A three. Three EC all the way. Yeah. Um, have you heard of guys using a two EC, but stacking harder in the media? Yeah, you, you can do that for sure. Um, typically I'll start with three. I mean, from clone even like, I mean, real young, they can take it. Um, start with three, run three all the way up until about week four. Um, and then when I'm, cause at week four, you're basically trying to flush out your substrate cause you just stacked it up pretty high and you're trying to get it back down again. Um, and so it doesn't take much. I mean, first off, you're never going to get it back to where it was. It's damn near impossible to get, you know, if you were at, you know, seven, eight, something like that to bring a substrate back down to your input, it's a, it's, it's tough. Even if it's just flushing and flushing, the closest I've ever really gotten is like three, five, you know, or three, eight or something around there. Um, and I don't ever see any problems with that. You know, usually it can be in the fours too, but at that time, if you are trying to get it down lower, that's a way you can do it. So like people can easily feed too easy at that point. Um, after, if they're stacking EC in the media. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If their whole goal is, you know, to bring it back down to three, for mm -hmm. example, and they're not able to do that feeding three EC, then dropping the EC at that point is, is totally fine. Our typical setup for a Demeter customer using Athena would be a three EC tank, a two EC tank, and then a flush tank, whether that's like a 0.5 to one, whatever the, the user wants to use. So you have that option to feed that lower EC if you want to get things back in check or towards end of life when we're kind of ramping things back down. Gotcha. So yeah. Those are the two feeds that we use the most is two and three. That would work perfect then. What, what media do you guys recommend when um, somebody's using a, a sensor, a substrate sensor? What, what were the medias you go to, go to medias? We're just for crop seeding in general, either cocoa or rock wool, you know, definitely, definitely no soil there takes too long to dry back. Um, and plus you might kill the biology. Um, my personal opinion is if I am using, if I have access to substrate sensors and valve control and, and all that, um, I prefer rock wool. Um, mainly uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, big thing for me is, is overwatering. Um, when I'm using cocoa, if something happens, um, say a valve, you know, something goes on like a valve breaks or, or, or leaks or something like that. Or in the case of when we were developing these programs, if, if <laughs> right. we used to have a program based off sensor and live sensor data, um, there's issues that can occur with cocoa. That's not Coco's fault. And it's, well, I'm sorry, let me take that back. It's not the sensor's fault. It's Coco's fault <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> where sure. basically you have a sensor like in the bottom of Coco, right? And just by the nature of how cocoa disperses water, it does so in a, you know, in a very uniform fashion and it, it's a slow seep, but you have a delay. So from the time that the irrigation event occurs and the drippers are, are dripping, there's usually like a minute to two minute delay before that water comes down and reaches that sensor at the bottom. And because of that, when we were using like live sensor triggers at that point, I would end up overwatering by a minute or two. And so when that was happening consistently, I'd end up with a waterlogged substrate, which then caused me a whole plethora of issues after that. So Rockwell, on the other hand, gives very quick readings. Um, so from the time that the, the irrigation event occurs, 
I usually can get a reading within 30 seconds. So the amount of, you know, overwatering is very, very minimal at that point. Um, if I wasn't using, you know, substrate sensors and sensor triggers specifically to control my valves, I would say cocoa, 100%. I think it's way more forgiving um, as long as you don't overwater it. And, you know, in general, it offers, you know, I, I don't think there's any, like, difference in results. So I think it's just user preference there. Do you find cocoa to channel when it dries out a little too much? Yeah, if you, I mean, if you get it, well, that happens with rock wool too. You know, when you okay. go down past a certain point, they're both going to channel. It might be even worse than rock wool potentially. Yeah, yep. So that's where having low flow drippers really helps. So Now talking about media size, what, if you're in uh, rock wool, what, what is, you know, your idea setup that you're seeing out in the field? Uh, typical configurations are you're either planting a clone directly into like a six by six, uh, six by six by six, or you're going into like a, some form of like Delta, you know, where you're in like a four by four by four, four by four by two. Um, and then you're doing your veg in that and then you're stacking it, you know, after a week onto either a slab, a Hugo, you know, a six by six by six or like a jumbo, which is the six by six by four. So it's either you're going directly in to a larger substrate or you are, starting it in a smaller one and then stacking it on a slab. Correct. Yeah. Nice. The, what about size of uh, media and a cocoa pot? Straight, co straight cocoa, right? We're talking straight right? cocoa. Yeah. Always, what, yeah. What's up with straight cocoa? What's up with cocoa and perlite? What's your opinion on that? I think it's a marketing gimmick. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you on that. I think the way cocoa is designed, um, you, you get plenty of aeration in there as long as you don't just sit there and flood it you know constantly 100 percent. i um, agree i i don't I'm not a big fan of perlite in my cocoa and especially yeah. when you're using cleanse it's absolutely makes no sense it, it also is really really bad for substrates too um so substrates can only read or sensors can only read the uh the substrate you know moisture content so the perlite's actually right. bad for the sensor any perlite very, very contacting bad. a sensor probe would yeah. give you an inaccurate it, it doesn't reading. read so like there's water being held in like pumice or perlite or something like that, but that's not able to be picked up by the sensor. Um, so if you stab a sensor in, and like you just said, if you've got perlite touching it, all it reads is a big open air gap now yep. where it's not being, having direct contact with the cocoa. So now what it's going to do is it's going to decrease the fuel capacity reading that you're getting. So it's not, it's not uncommon for people to, who are using like, you know, a 30% or a 50% mix of perlite in their cocoa to be like, why is my fuel capacity only 35% or 40%? It's like, well, that's why. If you use like a real pithy cocoa and you packed it in there nicely, you're going to get up into the 50s. You know, you're going to be pretty close to Rockwell. I don't know if you'll quite hit there, but you'll get close. What about size of pot? What's the idea size of pot that you're seeing in your opinion? I would say the smaller, the better. In my smaller, the better. Yeah. Really? I agree. Me yeah. too. I mean, I've started in fives, went to threes, went to two and a half, went to two. And now I'm in a one and a half gallon pot mm -hmm. running a pretty low density. And it allows me to give more irrigations uh, events, especially with that lower uh, volume root mass in the beginning of, of life. Uh, it allows me to control the medium a little bit better. And since we have precision irrigation and all this automation, I can irrigate as many times as I need to in a day. If I was hand watering, I would obviously want a bigger medium, right? Because you don't want to sit there and continually sure. irrigate the thing all day long. But with the technology we have now, going smaller is almost better. It's the bigger roots, bigger fruits argument, I think, is kind of gone these I days. I think that's kind of more of an organic argument. Well, yeah, they didn't more have soil. Bigger and, roots, bigger fruits, they didn't have access to irrigate necessarily 30 times a day. Right, exactly. So, so. now with what we have the smaller medium gives me a lot more control, um, which helps drive the plant exactly how I want it from day one. Yeah. No, I found the sweet spot to be about about the same size, 1.7 gallon, um, nothing over a two uh, mm -hmm. based on my, my, my um, footprint for, for plant per square foot. Right. Now but, moms are a different story though. Yeah, 100%. Well, yeah. I, I've grown, I've got some pictures. I've grown some <laughs> massive plants inside of like a one, just a one gallon quick fill. Yeah. I mean, stocks like outdoor stocks. 
So irrigating I, I, at 30 I've times a day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've yeah. done that test before too in a half gallon cocoa cube, <laughs> yeah. seeing how big of a mom I could grow. And it was about six feet tall and yeah. pretty ridiculous. But is that sustainable? No, no. 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 It's just experiments. Pumps going constantly. Yeah. But you could. Yeah, it, it's funny. I, I see guys, usually guys that are using cocoa with perlite, they'll be in a bigger pot. Because mm-hmm. I think they need to be based on the perlite mass taken away from the cocoa substrate. I don't know. That's just my theory. I don't know if that's even true or not. But it just seems like it usually, like you go into a place and the guy's in five gallons cocoa perlite. It's like if you just shrunk the pot size, you don't need the perlite. Yeah. The roots I mean, are going to do the job of giving yeah. you aeration at that point. I think they, they feel like maybe they did a five gallon straight cocoa. And like, oh, well, I get better results with cocoa perlite in a five gallon. Well, that's because it's holding on to, you got too much mass to control mm-hmm. with, with that. And the perlite's making it, giving them that buffer, that forgiveness um, for the uh, more aeration. But if they just shrunk the pot size, one, they have to buy less cocoa. Um, two, they'd control the media a lot better. And, and they, they'd get better sensor readings if they're using, you know, a substrate sensor. So it's just like you to each his own everybody has their own opinion this is just my i i'm i'm with you i I like straight cocoa you know um, i agree with you about that 1.5 gallon size pot nothing over a two it's it's also a really the 1.5 is also really good for it's that medium zones where i can put a a freshly rooted clone into that and i'm reducing the amount of sops that i have I'm one transplant, one medium to purchase. Like we don't have to buy all these different pot sizes, stock all this stuff. I can go directly rooted clone into that one and a half. Not, I'm not going to have as many irrigation events, obviously, when I'm rooting it in, in veg, but it's pretty damn happy in veg. And once it takes off, you go directly into the flower room and you're off to the races. You're not building a new root zone. And it's, I mean, yeah, it's money saved. It's labor saved. Yeah, labor. I mean, when you're talking thousands of plants, and yeah, I see a lot of guys. Um, one transplant is 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 enough for me, right? Clone from the clone tray into my 1.7 gallon cocoa, straight cocoa, uh, three EC Proline cleanse. May, you know, maybe five mLs on the cleanse if you're worried about water logging to add some extra oxygen, increase the ORP, but. If you're talking about thousands of plants and you were to go from a four inch straight cocoa into another two gallon pot or whatever size pot, you're talking about hundreds of man hours a year mm-hmm. in doing that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's cost savings. I, I've, I've gone into a lot of facilities where I'll see them move three times. They'll start in a small mm-hmm. cone pot, go to a bigger one for veg. And then when they go into flower, they're moved to a bigger pot. And I'm like, wow, that's extremely inefficient. Like yeah. they're losing thousands, <clears throat> tens of thousands of dollars a year on transplanting. And when they go into the flower room, they're, it's harder to get those generative, like hard drybacks because we don't have the roots in that new pot. Yep. Right? Uh, yeah. Where we build it early on in its life you can pretty much start steering immediately the second you go into that. That's that exactly room. why I, I'm a fan of like just one gallon pots. You know, like you were saying earlier, it's just like you have total control. And the way I said, the smaller the pot, the more control you have. Like you can push a heavy dry back quickly with a small plant mm-hmm. doing that. That's also why even Rockwell, like I'll, I always go to a four by four, you know, just so I can start steering. Cause I think a lot of people don't do this, but I think it's, it's a good thing to steer um, vegetatively like to actually steer vegetatively in veg, you know, to go for those 10% dry backs. I think that's pretty big, uh, in my opinion, versus... So your your go-to for rock wool is a four-inch in veg, and then you throw yeah. on a slab. Yeah, after about a week. Yeah, that's Jungle Boys, too. Yeah. That's their go-to. You're putting them on slabs in the veg room? Uh, so what I'll do is I'll... I, I mean, I, I'm all in the same room. Um, but, like, in facilities that do this as well, like, basically, they will veg inside of a veg room on a four-by-four, and then they'll saturate whatever it's a slab blocks, whatever in the flower room, and then they'll finish veg out in the flower room. Got it. So they'll finish whether it's another five days, another three days, another five days, whatever. A it short is. acclimation period. Exactly. Yeah. So what they're doing is they're allowing the roots to get down into the the next substrate before they flip. So mm-hmm. it's like reducing that stress. Right. Okay. Um, crop steering 1.0. What? What is, what was crop steering 
All right. <laughs> now we get into it. Um, so CropStream 1.0, a lot of a lot of people who you know are our customers, they're super familiar with it. They'll be able to re relate to a lot of things I'm going to say here. Um, for people who don't know, um, CropStream 1.0 is our our first go around at trying to provide a tool for growers, you know, to crop steer. Um, you know, I, I was very fortunate in, in, you know, being a technician at our company, getting to go around to a lot of different grows, um, seeing kind of what works, what doesn't um, for a while. And then I, I visited one grow in specific, like specifically actually here in California, um, growers, Kevin Crouch, he's amazing. And I saw uh, something I hadn't seen before. I just saw like yields like I'd never seen anywhere else, nothing I've ever been able to accomplish. And so I was like, what, what is this? What are you, what are you doing here? And he was nice enough to kind of like show me. And that's where kind of crop steering in my life came about, you know, as he, he taught me how that went. Um, and so we were talking and he was like, man, you know, he's got a, a bigger facility. He's like a hundred irrigation zones. And he's like, this is a lot to manage, you know, trying to do the crop steering with Rockwell, but managing your own timers. Um, He's like, it'd be, you know, you guys already use sensor, you know, you already are controlling our sensor data. You're already controlling our valve data. I wonder if there's a way that we could make a program that kind of can help automate that. And so that's kind of where the idea came about. And, you know, it was our, basically what our first rundown was, was a completely sensor-based program. So we were pulling in live sensor data, um, you know, from the substrate and, auto triggering valves, you know, we, we split up the program into those, we, we do four phases, you know, we, we do phase zero, one, two, three, four. The only difference there is, is we added in just a little name for phase zero, which is the time between the lights turning on. Yeah. Can you d d dive into phase zero? Because <clears throat> we didn't go over that in P1, P2, P3. Yeah. So yeah. What is phase zero? Yeah. It's not like a, a huge thing. It's just, uh, it's just a name that we put in to help differentiate for control purposes. Um, between the time the lights turn on in the morning and the time of the first irrigation event of P1 of the day. Um, and so usually that's a, a certain dryback, additional dryback percentage that we're looking to achieve. Um, and really what that what that's telling us is like, hey, the plant has started metabolizing, it started photosynthesizing, it's rocking now. You know, now we're good to start irrigating and letting it, you know, use the nutrients we're giving it. Why, why did you guys decide to do a P0? Well, for what, so, so. Do you want to answer that? We're rebels. No, okay, we're rebels. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be different. Nobody else is doing it. No, uh, a lot of things were um, over. So it, it has a big use case for like greenhouses specifically, but it also is indoor too. Like if you happen to, like if you trim, you know, or you spray, you know, say you defoliate, um, you know, week two, week three, or you spray, you know, every once a week or whatever. After you do that, the plant does not transpire as rapidly as it was doing previous to that. It takes a couple of days for it to get back to where it was. And so in a situation like that, uh, if you continued with a, just a straight irrigation timer schedule afterwards without taking that into account, um, you're going to end up overwatering. It'll be like a snowball effect because it didn't dry out the amount that it usually dried out. Now you're watering more, which then causes it to not dry out more, you know, than it should have. And that just continues on and on and on. Same, same thing with greenhouses. If you're in a cloudy day, you know, cloudy week, you're not going to transpire as much. Um, and so having the ability to, because we already had the data, having the ability to see, okay, the plant is drying back. It's, it's, it's hitting the level that I wanted it to hit before I start irrigating. We thought that that was pretty useful. Um, so that we added it in mainly as just another tool. So if you want to use it, great. So your you system, know. like your software, mm -hmm. calculates based on climate and will adjust the P1, which is your first irrigation event, based on the substrate water content. Yes and no. So, <laughs> yeah. so the, the climate it part. Can. Yeah. It can. It can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, oh, we, we are tracking all the climate data. Um, I, how, how far do we want to get? I guess we're not going to talk about the co-pilot just yet. I mean, you can, you, I mean, we're here. Yeah. You could talk a little bit about it and we could touch on it and move on. Can we take a quick break? Yeah, for sure. All right. All right. Crop steering 1.0 versus kind of like 2.0, right? Yeah. So 1.0, like I was saying, 
1.0 was our first attempt at creating a program that could help growers crop steer. You know, we did base it solely off of live sensor data, um, and that ended up causing, it, it worked well for a lot of people, but it also it caused some problems for others. Um, the big thing to touch on with 1.0 is it was originally geared, you know, honestly for people who knew exactly what they were doing with crop steering and were, were trying to have a tool to help them do that at their facility. Um, so I think, I think I mentioned we might have, I think we oversold it, to be honest with you. Um, selling it more of set it and forget it, kind of more automated, where it does require knowledge of crop steering and it does require some interaction as your field capacity changes. Um, so, of, uh, What are the main differences between crop steering 1.0 and crop steering 2.0? So 1.0, I'm going to... I'll, I'll list like basically these are the common issues that I mean, we, we worked with customers for almost two years on this. Um, so we got a lot of feedback on it. Yeah. And I want to mention that you guys are doing something that nobody else is doing, right? You guys are automating irrigation strategy, you know, for a specific crop, which has never been done before. So of course you guys are always, you're going to make mistakes and, and you're going to have to, you know, redo it. So uh, that's, I mean, the big reason why I have you guys on is just because of what you guys are doing with, with this program. And I think it's going to change the industry. I mean, for sure. Hope so. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, you're good. No, and, thanks. But, but that, what you just said, that's exactly, you know, why we rely, we relied heavily on our customers, you know, to give us a lot of feedback and that's how we made, you know, Copilot, you know, 2.0. Uh, was based on that feedback, you know, based on issues that I experienced, based on issues that our customers experienced and, and relayed back to us. You know, with, with that original program, the interface was a big thing. You know, it was real boring. You know, it was just a white chart input, you know, where it's like, here, enter in exactly what you, well, you, know, what you want your shot sizes to be, what you want your dry back percentages to be. So if you knew what you were talking about, you knew everything about it already, great, you could enter that in. But it was... It also functioned like a black box. So like you didn't really know what was happening. If like you're like, okay, I, I know I think I want this percentage because I think it's gonna do this, but you had no way of knowing until you programmed it in and then waited to see what it did to your plants the next day. So you were like putting a lot of trust into a program that didn't explain to you at all what it was doing or how it worked. Cause it was it's actually super oops, it's actually super intricate on the back end on how it was programmed um, to, to work. Um, so that was a big thing was the, the user interface, the visualization of how it was going on. We wanted to address that with, with Copilot. Um, there was other issues with, because it's a sensor trigger base, we had uh, fuel capacity. You know, as you guys know, fuel capacity is not uh, stationary. It changes uh, sometimes every day. You know, as your roots grow into the substrate, um, as you, you know, uh, mainly from roots taking up space volume inside the substrate and from, you know, when you, when you dry back real, real hard and then you go to reconstitute it again, eventually you start losing, you know, overall volume holding capacity in the substrate uh, that you kind of never really get back. And so, you know, as we notice this big, big time uh, when you're going in small pots, you know, one gallon pot and you're, you're starting to get week five, week six, most of that pot now is roots at this point. Um, and roots, while they hold water, you know, in the cellulose of them, the, the probes can't read it just like perlite. So what's happening is, is it's like you're adding perlite into the substrate, essentially. And so what would end up happening is your fuel capacity would drop, you know, from 55 down to 54 the next day, then 53, then 52, and that would continuously happen. Um, and we had, the way we set up that old program was you couldn't move on to the next phase until you satisfied whatever you programmed in. So if I said, you know, I want to, for phase one, you know, if my fuel capacity target was 55%, it's not going to move me into maintenance phase until I hit 55%, like sensor reading. And if the sensor couldn't actually read 55%, it's going to continue to try to ramp up until light, you know, until the batch tank is empty, essentially. So it's just draining batch tanks. A left and right. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you went outside of the crop steering program and you set up some sort of uh, overrides, but yeah. they weren't built into the crop steering program. So that was a, that was a mistake. Which is why, you, you know, kind of 1.0, you had to be an experienced. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you had to know what you were doing to use that program properly. Otherwise it could cause a lot of issues. Um, 
we, we mentioned earlier, you know, that delay with Coco. Um, this is an inherent delay, and that, that delay actually gets bigger the larger pot you use. So if you're using like a five-gallon pot, we were seeing delays of 10 minutes, you know, sometimes between when the drippers would go um, and the reading would, would pick up. We did find fixes for that where it's like use higher flow drippers and it, you know, worked better, but that's not what we want. You know, we want the low flow drippers. We want the even saturation, not channeling. Um, so that was, that was a big problem because we were a sensor-based program at that point. So you were always overshooting. It just seemed to happen very consistently when growing in cocoa. So that was a big thing we had to overcome because I would say the majority of the industry uses cocoa. Um, so it was... In yeah. my opinion, and not the greatest for cocoa. I think one of the big lessons, though, is just you, you really can't use real time sensor data for the entire program. Yeah. Right. Um, and so when we dive into 2.0, we'll talk about how we use sensor data mm -hmm. in a different way instead of real time. So, yeah. And it, real quick, I'll just wrap this up. I don't want to go on forever, forever <laughs> all the problems, but they do become relevant in what we address for 2.0. Um, we didn't have the ability to flush. And we didn't have the ability to disable maintenance phase. Um, so you were getting, basically you had your ramp up and you had maintenance no matter what. You could shorten the maintenance phase, but it's not the same. Um, if, you, if you just get rid of a maintenance phase when you're trying to stack EC and you don't have a flush, your EC is going to go through the roof. You can't, you, you, there's no way around that. You have to be able to flush something out if you're going to get rid of that whole maintenance phase and just go to a straight dry back to be able to have like a 30% dry back. Um, that was a huge, huge. Are you saying maintenance phase is like your P two? Yeah, yeah. I P2s. think it's I think it's important to 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 quote the P two. Yeah, yeah. Just because they'll understand. Yeah, okay. for sure. So yeah. maintenance phase is P two. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So you were going in basically with our with our one You could go from P one to P two and and to P three. That was it. Whereas this is something that Dylan you know brought up. This was like one of the main things was. You know, you're trying to steer generatively in the first three weeks. Um, you can't, and you're trying to stack EC while also providing the largest dry back you could possibly hit. And the only way to actually do that is to just have a P1 and then just dry back from there. You know, no P2 at that point. So you're giving the plant the most time with the lights on to actually dry back. And again, if you try doing that um, over a course of three to four days, your EC is going to climb to a bad level, you know, way too high. And so the only workaround around that was to just get off the program and go to a timer-based solution, which was what we were doing for a lot of people, is reworking their timers specifically for those first three weeks, and then they could go back to the program again. 1% um, shot size was a thing that we put in there. That was a tough one to overcome because, uh, you know, you have to calibrate everything. You know, everyone's dripper sizes are different. Everyone's got a different substrate. Um, different environments, you know, all that. And so what's 1% for some people might not be 1% for other people. And of course you could go off calculations, you know, from manufacturers and stuff. But when we did like real world testing, it was never like the volume that they say is for, you know, in a, a block or in a, a pot, it's, it's, it might be close, but I've measured so many countless side by side, you know, I've tore apart all these. They'd never, I've never once had, even from the same batch, any of them weigh the same. You know, so there are different volumes in every one. Um, and so to, to kind of account for like, okay, what's, what, what, what dripper flow, what, what is, what does 5% mean? You know, shot size wise, what does 5% mean? We had to calc we had to define what 1% was. So we had this like complex way of, of running your irrigations and timing it and measuring what the rise was and then inputting that in. And it was kind of a pain. Um, and then the last thing was no EC targeting. So a big part of crop steering is substrate EC. Um, you had to do that manually, which was doable. You know, like I said, through P2, you could adjust those maintenance shots and and or, or adjust your uh, input EC. But but they would have to know how yeah. to do that because the system's not directing you. In, yeah, going back to it's for an experienced exactly guy so, that does, uh, no understands precision irrigation strategy. Yeah, I mean the goal yeah. was to to get rid of the. The charts and the graphs and the spreadsheets and the math. Yeah. And we just didn't quite hit it with 1.0. And then that's, you know, that's kind of what we went back to and we looked at building it again with 2.0. Yeah. And that was the thing. We couldn't just make an editation because A, people were using it. And B, the, the changes were so vast that it's a whole different program at this point. So we started building 2.0, you know, we call it Copilot. 
Um, why do you what 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 why do you call it copilot? Um, yeah, basically because it's it's guiding you or giving you it's it's like it's like having a wingman, right? It's giving you the when we dive into it, we're we're collecting all this enormous amount of data. And then we're using that data to give you suggestions. And so it's your co-pilot. We're just suggesting that you change your P1 timers or you uh, stop irrigating an hour earlier. You know, so that's kind of like, the, that's kind you're of the grower. You know, this you're the is grower. Not, this yeah. is not meant to take the job of the grower. Yeah. It, we, you can't trust technology like that. <laughs> no. Um, this is meant to be your, your assistant. You know, this is meant to help people who are, you know, A, trying to learn crop steering and get better at it, either on a small scale or people who are f familiar with it and are running big facilities, but they've got 300 graphs to look at a day, you know, and they don't have the time of day. This is meant to have that assistant there to be like, hey, I got you. Like, you're programming me. You're, t you're telling the co-pilot what you want it to do, and then it's going to do it for you and help you out. I think what I like about co-pilot is it's not just making the changes for you. It's telling you why you should make those changes. So, it's a tutorial as you're growing real time, right? Like as you're exactly. working through your cycle, it's like, hey, your targets are this. You should alter this to achieve that effect. And so it's teaching people to actually learn how to do this rather than just doing it for them. And they don't know why the timers are changing and what's happening. It's exactly it's, it's, a, it's a tutor for you, which is really cool. And that's what we were yeah. going for because we dropped the ball on that the first time. You know, we were like, we didn't give any instructions on how to do this oh. stuff. And we didn't, yeah. people weren't learning. They were calling in and we we're having to do private sessions, you know, teaching them how to, how to, how to use it. The computer isn't here. growing my weed properly. Yeah. What's wrong? Yeah. yeah. And so we always say it was a black box. Like you just put a, some variables in and then it just does its thing and you don't know why. Magic. And yeah. <laughs> it's like magic. And so we really wanted to get rid of that and bring visibility into everything that's happening Make sure you know when every single irrigation event is going to happen and why it's happening right. and, and why you need to change it. <laughs> eventually, after reading the suggestions enough and applying them, it's going to click in your head and you're like, oh, okay. It's just like a live tutor, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, so that, that's a big part of, of 2.0, the change we did is we made the interface way, way easier to use, honestly, way more appealing. Um, and, and again, you know, it's meant to teach. As well, it's not just meant to you to input things in and it works like magic. It's meant to show you exactly what's happening. Um, and with, with that new UI uh, comes. Is this the interface right here? Yeah, I'm gonna. One sec, I'll get this going. So this is our our, our new portal here. Um, this this would be. Oops. Yeah, this would be like a dashboard here. So basically, you would go up to the you have your own irrigation tab now, and you would. Go straight to the irrigation tab. And here is, again, this is all formed from user inputs. Uh, you know, Sean, you helped us with this one right here. Um, having a, a dashboard where you can see all of your programs, all of your timers, you know, so because um, you don't just have to create a copilot program, you can also just do simple timers as well. And then this gives you a screen that shows, or like a, a timeline view to see these are all my irrigation events that are currently happening. What, what's the difference between the blue? dashes and the green ones they're just different programs so, so they're broken up in different colors for every different program so you could visually see at a glance like that's one program this is another program this is another one. zone one zone two right oh, okay. Yeah. okay yeah so you can see here i have like one program as a demo here and this is a custom timer demo okay if gotcha. i add another one um, would it be a different color or? uh yeah it'll come up come okay. out in a different row a different color all right yeah, basically, I'll, I'll add one here in a sec, but you'll see it'll, it'll just keep stacking. And then you, the big thing of this is you can see, you know, when valves are overlapping and you can time them properly. Yes, because you don't, you might not want valves overlapping due exactly. to a pump or whatever exactly. like that. You're overriding your flow time. rates. Like yeah. a lot of, when we design facilities, we talk with the growers, how many rooms would need to irrigate at the exact same time off of the same tank? Mm -hmm. And so we build the tank, the pump, the piping, everything to accommodate that mm -hmm. so if they override that and they see oh i have three overlaps and i was yeah. only built for two flow rate will be, be off the psi will be off and then we won't yeah. get emitters properly yep. irrigating yeah so just to give you like a quick you know example this is like a new interface here so like this is where you're going to go to set up your timers um if i could fit it all on the screen i, I would but i can't so i got to scroll a little bit um, but as you can see now, instead of having all those fields put in, we've got everything broken down into phase one, phase two, and then we have a flush addition here. 
with uh, the ability to enable and disable any of these. When would you use the flush? So the flush is going to be used in, uh, specifically when the first three weeks of flower during stretch when we are trying to stack our EC um, to a controlled manner and maximize our drybacks. So like we were just talking about a little earlier, if we just go to this graph here, here's our ramp up. Mm -hmm. P1. Yep, P1. If I want to have the maximum dry back, I have to start it when the lights, as, as soon as that's done. Like I have to get it up to a certain level. It has to have water. The plant needs to survive. Fuel capacity. Yeah, so what you have to hit fuel capacity. But then after that, if we just immediately start drying back, the more time that your plant is not getting water while the lights are on, it's going to drink way faster than when the lights are off. So typically what will happen is you'll have a much steeper decline here and then it'll flatten out overnight. Um, so in order to get the maximum drybacks that we could potentially push, we need to stop it right after P P1 here. Um, and like we were talking about, if you did that and you just ramped up to P1, didn't push a ton of runoff because you just hit your fuel capacity and then you immediately went to drying back, you're now not pushing runoff for several days. Um, over and over and over, your EC is going to start to just skyrocket at that point. So we need a way to bring it down without sacrificing so this time. So you're using the flush after week, after you're done yes. with your with your generative. No, it's after your P1 shot. Your P1. You're breaking field capacity with your P1 like we talked about earlier. So I could, I could show you here. So yep. if I turn a flush on, the graph will update. And that was one of the features here we were talking about. So it's now added the flush in. It's a short flush. I could change this to, you know. You can see it. Make it 30 minutes. And so now this flush here just increased. So it's always going to come right after your P1. Um, why? Is because you're already at your field capacity. So if you really want to get it flushed down. Just to lower EC. Just right. to lower EC. Gotcha. You're just flushing out excess built up salts inside the, the substrate. Um, having this flush here is necessary because what you're doing now is you're allowing the substrate to get flushed out, pushing all those built up salts. But look how it doesn't take that much time. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's a lot faster. You're basically accomplishing the same thing here as you would running this, this whole cycle. Um, so you're basically, think of a flush as like a super condensed controlled P2. Now, when you're talking about a flush, what's your EC value with that? What do you mean? Like what are you, where are you getting your, if you're doing like a flush, mm -hmm. usually flush means a low EC value, one EC or 500. No, no. So in this case, you're actually just going to keep the same input EC. By flush, okay. by flush we're saying we're going to push a lot of runoff. In okay. The yeah. More runoff. All right. right. Rather than, because it'll keep stacking and stacking and stacking. If we keep putting 3 on top of 3 on top of 3 yeah, yeah. without any yeah, runoff. Yeah. We're so gonna you're just going to get up. excess runoff. Correct. After, Correct. When yep. you hit fill capacity, you're going to give excess runoff. Mm -hmm. And that's going to lower the EC value in your substrate. And then you'll continue with your P2. Correct. Yep. Okay. Or you don't have a P2 at all. Okay. So really the way I like, the way we've designed this, and this is just kind of how it typically goes, is you're either going to use flush or you're going to use P2 to manage your EC. Rarely do you use both other than late, very, very late flower when you're finishing and you're just trying to steer a little bit more generative, but maybe your EC got too high. You know, but your plants are huge for your substrate size and they're drinking a ton. So you need to keep a P2 in so that you don't end up with like a 30 plus percent dry back um, if that's not what you wanted. Right. So that's a very like nuanced case that you're going to use both. But essentially these are going to be interchangeable. So like if a, P2 is, uh, if a P2 is active, typically you will not have a flush active. And if a flush is active, typically you will not have a P2 active. Yeah, like turn off P2 right now and we'll see what it does to the graph. We're using the lights and the natural transpiration during mm -hmm. lights on to get that hard dry back. Dude, this is amazing. So you won't, you don't, this, you're setting your timer right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm editing what I want my timer to be and I can play around with it all I want. I haven't saved anything. So that's a cool feature of this is I can cycle between all of these pages and update my targets and do all sorts of stuff to build it exactly like I think I want it. And it'll show me exactly what I'm going to do. And then at the end, I can apply it. Or I could erase all the changes and go back to the way it was, you know. And Copilot will make recommendations based on the data that it's getting from your substrate. Yeah, so I'll explain yeah. that real quick here. I'll just do a quick, quick explanation. Put it back to the way it was. So what Copilot is, this is our fourth tab here, suggestions. The AI will essentially take, this is your real data. Oh, 
this is the real data. So you can click and see your real data over on any of these pages, you know, so you can overlay your data. So what this is here, this is a the target data. So this is what it should be based on what you have here. This is what's actually happening here. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of overlay that stuff. So what Copilot does is it takes your real data here and then it compares it with what you want to happen through your targets page. So if you go up here, you have like four little tabs. You mainly are using these two here. Yeah, maybe run through that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah. Start the run through the let's whole go to thing information and, then, and schedule yeah. and targets. Okay. Um, you got, you got, yeah, you got, so I'm, the, I'm a dummy. So, no, 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 so yeah, help me out here. So when you first go to create a program, you're going to have a form that pops up as step one here, right? Uh, this is collecting basic information. And what this information does is it helps us generate default values for you um, and populate set timer programs. So for the customers who don't necessarily know all about crop steering or they don't know what their target should be or anything like that, we've programmed in what we found to be, you know, pretty generic very usable uh, timer sequences that they can use, still get pretty good success. If and you have one gallon pot I see there. You yeah, can so change you, that three, yeah. five. Correct. So okay. you, can, you can select rock, all the different rock wool types uh, and, and different cocoa types here. And each one of those cocoa types and substrate types have kind of some different recommendations. Yeah. Kind of what you have in here, yeah. right? We're just, we're collecting. That same data, yeah. but you're inputting data. it into software. So that's the, incredible. So basically we've like taken the default volumes and again, they're not perfect, but we've taken the, they don't have to be, that's the cool part. So we've taken the default volumes like for all of these substrates and we have that. Then we are also selecting, I'll go through it here. You're going to select your, your, your probe, your valve that you're trying to control or valves, you know, whatever, however many it needs to be. Um, we have a steering method. So again, this is just for populating defaults. So at the current time that you're activating this program, are you doing vegetative or generative? And what that's doing is it's going to tell us like, okay, these are the target values I want, or these are the target values I want. Um, then we're selecting, you know, your dripper flows, um, number of emitters. So that's 0.5. Is that 0.5? Yeah, what I'm if you have out. two drippers per plant? Then it's 1.0, so, right? I get, we are actually making an update right now. Oh, talk to Sean. Yeah. You guys. Yeah. So you we're making guys. an update on this where we're changing it to the dripper type how many drippers per plant and the total number okay, of plants. Okay, yeah, because that's important. I use, so mm -hmm. me, I use 2.5s for a 1.7 gallon cocoa pot, mm -hmm. straight cocoa. Yeah, so in this scenario, you would just, you would do the math yourself and say one because okay. it's 2.5s, but we are changing that. Make we it are, a little bit more intuitive. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> we are yeah. changing that to make it more intuitive. That's a lot better. 2.1. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the thing, you know, that's what, what I like about this company is like our guys are able to just make changes like super quick. You know, when we get the feedback in, um, we're like, hey, yeah, that makes sense. The benefits really of being strong in software. Yeah. I had a couple of basic recommendations after I got a tutorial on this a couple of weeks ago and the changes were implemented within a couple of days. I was, all right, awesome. <laughs> they were pretty good changes. So they were like, yeah, that, that needs to happen. Um so, so yeah, I mean, and if you're using, you know, like our fertigation skid that we have, um, you can select a dosing recipe for direct injection as well through here, and it'll specify like what recipe is going to get dosed, um, lights on, lights off time, and then you have the ability to, to schedule alerts. So you can dose your recipe, but is that more with your skid? Yeah. Yeah, if you're yeah, doing direct because, inject straight to the plant. Yeah, yep, okay. But uh, otherwise you would select tank, the batch tank. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. it's, yeah, the batch tank is going to be selected through the valve, whatever valve you select. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, but as you can see here, like whatever you click on, um, you get tool tips as well. That's something we didn't have on the other one where it explains, you know, exactly what it is that we're trying to collect, why, you ne why we need it, and what we're going to do with it. Um, so moving on, you know, to the next, it, if you press next after you enter that information in, you will have all of these values populated, you will have a graph populated for you. Based on the information you yes. put in, it'll give you your schedule. Correct. A good starting yep. point. A good starting point. Yeah. You can, if you know what you're doing and you're like, oh, I don't agree with that, feel free. You are you have full customizability. You can change anything you want in here. And you have four foot, four by four rock wool with slab XYZ size. Yeah, we're, we're adding a custom option in as well too. So okay. that if you've got like some weird wonky setup, you can... And put in whatever you but want. But you do have the 4x4 four four with slabs in there. I believe so, yeah. 
in the information portal. And that, mm-hmm. that changes your schedule. That's amazing. Yeah. And so again, you have this interactive graph is going to be through all of your pages. Same thing. Um, it will be different for each one. So like on the targets page, you will see the graph update based on the targets that you're setting. Run through those real quick. Yeah, so we already kind of went over the schedule. So on the targets here, we we collect the same information we did from the other one, just in a more simplified form. So for phase zero, we're looking for your additional dryback target percentage. Uh, Phase one, we're looking for your ramp-up shot size percentage, your ramp-up shot dryback percentage, and your field capacity. And one cool thing here is, like, if you didn't know what that was, you could click... It tells you what it is over here, and then it also highlights what it is on the graph. So if I go here, my ramp up shot, you can see it's highlighting just specifically the shot. It's kind of hard to tell because of how, you know, uh, minimal this one percent dryback is, but you can see it's highlighted those there. Do you so for that P zero for the greenhouse growers out there, mm-hmm. and if they say it's a colder night or a cloudier day it won't activate P1 until it gets down to that dryback percentage? It depends. We've gave you the option for that. So I'll get, I'll get to that in just we, one sec. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. One sec. When we get to the suggestions, I'll, that's a big part of it, actually. Um, so what, what this does, though, is this: everything you click, it highlights. It shows you what it is. Um, and if I go to edit anything here, um, you know, like my maintenance dryback percentage, just as an example, I can make that, you know... Five, and this will update, and it's now changed. It shows you exactly what you're trying to do now. Um, what was that at three or two before? And so now we'll move to suggestions. And, and again, you can always you can always overlap real data at any point through these. So here's where the magic happens. So what Copilot is doing is it's taking. The, the details that you had on your schedule page, like what's actually happening in, in your, your, you know, those values. And then it's comparing it to what your target is, what you want your target to be. Um, and then it figures out a way, like changes that you can make to both targets and schedule to bring those two together. Um, so in a way, this target page is you programming AI to do exactly what you want. And it's going to manipulate everything else to make that happen. So when you have suggestions, which they'll come every 24 hours, that's the way this works. Uh, that was a big thing we should probably touch on. Is sensor base was a big issue with the last one for a multitude of reasons. So what we're now doing is timer based. So as you can see, you know those are those are timers here. So these events are going to happen no matter what. You know you're not going to have a drain batch tank issue anymore. You're not you know you're not going to have any you know fuel capacity issues. You're not going to have any weird delays that you don't want to It's not have. just going to irrigate until it hits the, a, a, the water content that you say you want. Exactly. What it's going to do is it's going to look at what you want. It knows what you want to do, and it's going to look at what you did. And it's going to say, okay, you didn't hit your field capacity. And you it's know? going to give you recommendations. It's going to tell you. It's, it has. That's where the advanced like calculations come in. It's like, okay, we've analyzed the trends. You need to change this, you know, this percentage to that, or you need to change yeah. you know, this time to this to hit you know, the goal. So 1% shot size out the window. You don't Does need it, it analyze anymore. in 24 hour blocks. Yes. Okay. So 24 hour blocks in what, three or four hours uh, at the end of the block is when you get the suggestions and you can apply them or deny them at that point. See with real time sensor data, right? Remember the delay we were talking about, um, Coco mm-hmm. and you had that 10 minute delay, let's say, well, now when you're analyzing the data overnight, we know the delay, right? Because you know, we saw how much yeah, we fed based on a timer, yeah. and we saw how long it took to It doesn't to matter get a whether it registered immediately or 10 minutes later. Yeah. Nope. You're still seeing those same trends on the graph, and you so, can analyze right. that if as you, a whole. If you want to grow in a 10-gallon cocoa pot, I don't recommend this with 0.3 emitters, <laughs> by all means, go for it. You know, if you have a 45-minute delay from the time that you, we actually read it, it doesn't matter. It'll learn. It'll yeah. learn it, and it'll say, okay, I know you've got this delay. Maybe it'll tell you. To, maybe we can make it say, "Hey, maybe change your setup a little bit." <laughs> but you know, um, but really, here's the, what what you were just talking about, Sean. Um, is these are the suggestions? It breaks them up into the phases, so like P1, P2, and it'll tell you. First off, we make it very polite. You know, consider doing this. <laughs> so we don't. Yeah. Have, you know, so basically, this is telling us right now, our targets. Th- this is what we have, and this is what we want. And you can see they're close, but they're not, it's not that. So how do we get it to this? How do we, how do we make this here um, turn into 
this. And so what it's telling us to do in order to do that is to change our fuel capacity target from 45 to 60% because Copilot has detected that 60% is closer to your actual fuel capacity. So it's letting you know like, hey, you know, you're at, this is at 45 and you're actually hitting up here at 58.6 or actually, no, it does go up to 60 right there. Yeah. So, um, and then for P2, it says consider changing your P2 timer quantity from four to six to get closer to your overnight dryback target and increase the amount of P2 irrigation events to get more runoff to get closer to your target EC. So that was actually one thing I kind of forgot about here. Target EC. Pretty fucking, it, uh, sorry, pretty huge. Yeah, huge fucking. Pretty huge. Uh, having a target EC here um, because that that was, I mean, that's really, really intense for for any software. Yeah, EC is right a pretty now. big deal. That, I think that was the most impressive part about this whole software change to me is you're not just taking water content to affect to crops here. You're actually taking e substrate EC into account, so we have the ability to stack or run off and drive the plant how we want to, versus what everybody else has tried to do and what what 1.0 was before is just water content. We couldn't mm -hmm. actually drive based off of EC, and that's right. what I didn't think would be possible for a very long time. And here it is. Like, yeah, it's, it's awesome. It, it worked out. It, it's. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. Um, super yeah. proud of that one. Um, but yeah, th basically it's telling you what you need to do. So the way we do this is we can, we I can kind of explain a bit on the back end like what it manipulates in order to adjust your EC without sacrificing your water content. So it has to work together with both of those because there's easy ways to manipulate your EC and sacrifice your water content. So we had to find a way to make them mesh together, um, which I go over here in a sec. But it says, consider tar uh, changing your P2 timer interval from one hour, 50 minutes to 45 minutes to get closer to your overnight dryback target and get more wrong. Again, these are both EC recommendations here and dryback target. And the recommendations, you don't have to implement them if you don't want to. No. Nope. So if, you're, if you read these and you're like, eh, I don't agree with that, you just press ignore. Um, but if you're like, hmm, that might, be, that might be something, you actually have the ability to preview. So based on the changes that it's uh, implying it wants to make, you can press preview. Oops. Oh, I think I messed something up by tweaking everything. But basically what it'll do, these are what it's it'll, interposing. It'll, 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 it'll yeah. preview yeah. what you're going to see tomorrow? Exactly. Wow. So, well, this is, that's actually what it just did. I just kind of messed it up because we were messing with things there. But basically you saw the graph before where it stretched all the way out to here. When I pressed preview, it applied those changes and it shows this is what your new graph will look like at this point. Um, so when I overlay my substrate data, it gets a hell of a lot closer, as you can see here. So um, basically, it is these are the tweaks that it needs to make to bring those two together. Um, and and, and same, same with EC as well, you know, you'd be able to do the same thing. Um, but yeah, so if I want to apply them, so we could take a look real quick just to show you how it works. Um, I think it was adjusting our our uh, the schedule. I think it was adjusting our... Yeah, you had an hour and 50 minute interval Yeah, hour there. and 50 minute here and the number frequency of those P2 shots is what we have here. And then in our targets, our field capacity is at 45. And it'll, it'll give you recommendations of changing any of those. Yeah, so... So it, 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 irrigation events, um, times... Everything. Everything. Targets. It that's tries awesome. not to adjust your targets because that's what you want, unless it's something like field capacity or something like that. Right. Where something just, that changes. If it, yeah. if it sees that you're, there's a 0% chance you're ever going to hit your target because you can't, you know, then it will recommend you change it to a, a something you can hit at that point. But usually it's going to manipulate your actual timers. So if I press apply, it's, it's now applied them. Uh, this just happened because I don't have a controller hooked up to it. Oops, dismiss. Um, so now if I go to my targets, my fuel capacity is now 60. Um, and then in schedule, we're down to 45 minutes with six frequency there. And this is what our new graph looks like. So when I overlay my moisture content, this is what we're getting a, a lot closer. And the way this works is it analyzes it at every 24 hours and tweaks it and fine tunes it. So over, it might not be perfect day one, but over a period of like three to five days, you're going to be spot on, especially when it comes to EC. And talk about when those suggestions are populated, what time of day compared to when your lights are on. So that was actually something we just came up with or came across actually that we're, we just put a fix in for is 
basically it would happen right at the the last the last bit of that 24 hour cycle is when it would give you those recommendations and before we had it set where it was like you had about what like a three hour window or something to apply those and if you didn't apply them it would say uh suggestion expired and you're there's no more suggestions you can't you can't apply them anymore and the reason for that is you got to think about it it's like every 24 hour period it, it starts analyzing again and so like it expected you to make those changes that it told you to make. And if you didn't do that, now it's having to reanalyze again because, you know, you're, you're, you didn't make those changes and now you're 24 hours. Yeah, you don't past. want to do them halfway through a day and exactly. mess up your, your, the, anal the analyzing of that 24 hour period for the next day. Exactly. But so what we've done now is we made it to where, because people were having problems. They're like, oh, with my lights, you know, uh, it was at midnight, you know, so I got suggestions at three in the morning or something and I wasn't awake to apply those. Um, so what we did was for right now, cause we, we will have a feature called autopilot here, when hopefully in the next couple of weeks or so that will auto apply these features. So if you've deemed that you trust it, you could just turn on autopilot yeah. right here with this little, uh, this little toggle mm -hmm. and it will just go ahead and auto apply them daily. So right. all you need to do is just go in and say, yeah, things are looking good. I think building trust in the system first yes. before we go into full. Yeah. Giving the customer the right. option. We're yeah. testing it right now, but just, I mean, coming from 1.0 and the feedback we got, we need to deliver something that people believe in and trust. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the no more black box. Now, you know, in every irrigation event going to happen spelled out for you. Here's every single event that's going to happen to achieve your goals. Uh, and then the suggestions coming over. And once somebody gets comfortable with the suggestions, they're in, oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. We'll build that trust over months. And then we'll enable the autopilot so they can just auto apply those suggestions. Right. Yeah. But for now, uh, we have extended it. So it's like you can apply them at any point when you wake up in the morning, but it will give you a warning that says, hey, just letting you know, you know, this is going to skew the data a bit mm. because you didn't apply it in that window, that couple hour window when we Ideally, it. you want to apply it right before <laughs> lights on. You want to, yeah, you want to apply it right when it, within the three hour window that they're available. Um, so, because it's. And it's, when is that 24 hours? calculated so if it's like if your lights are from say 8 a.m to 8 p.m when is it does it start 24 hours at 8 a.m is that when it good is question. I be, yeah that's a good question for our devs um i, I believe it's from the time of program creation so it. it doesn't matter what time you know because you could create a program in the middle of your night cycle um and it's going to recognize that you're in the middle of your night cycle um so i would assume it would be from from that but i'll get clarification on that um one last thing I wanted to kind of touch on real quick is what we were talking about, what you bring back, what you had said about yeah, the P0. I was going to ask you about that with, you know, being a greenhouse grower, mm -hmm. you know, we're dealing with a lot of different um, variables and climate and that will obviously change your P1 event. Mm -hmm. So what, what does the system do to, to counteract that? So we have the ability to prioritize what you as a grower want. So some people, you know, they're, they're more, concerned with circadian rhythm and they want to make sure that every day at the same time we are starting our p1 irrigations whereas other growers they have a more of a, a nuanced use case for it where they're like oh i would rather i care more about that specific dryback percentage that's happening um and and so i don't care exactly when it starts i want to make sure it's going to start after i've dried back that specified amount no matter what though uh, I will say the program's going to try to get all of it lined up anyway. So if you're additional dryback, you're just not hitting it in that time window, it's going to tell you, hey, maybe you need to adjust that that amount. Um, and would that come off of your, would you just, would you stop your P2 event sooner in the day so you could have a larger dryback of P3? Correct. Okay. Um, and so it'll, it, there's a, the tool tip here. So like you can click down and you can either prioritize, um, you could, Prioritize start time, or you could prioritize starting uh, water content. What does uh, VWC stand for? Volumetric water content. Okay, what what does that mean? That's the water content readings that you're getting okay. based on volume. The volume of water. Okay. Yeah, so like 55% or 60% of this substrate is water. Gotcha. Um, and so you can choose between these, and there'll be different suggestions for each. Um, and based on applying it the way you want. They both will do the same thing minus or you know within that reason you know the the start time there and so it tells you here too it's like uh basically when you prioritize your start time you're basically telling copilot that you want to make sure that your irrigation events start at a particular time every day regardless of whether or not the water content percentage has dropped to your additional dryback target 
Um, and same thing. You go here and it'll tell you like it's, it's this based. isn't based on time anymore. It's now yeah. based on your water content of your media. Yeah, you just want to make sure your irrigation events or they want to you want to tell copilot that you want to make sure your irrigation events start only once you've achieved that additional dryback and it will modify your irrigation start time every day. Yeah. Yeah. That is really cool. That is really big for greenhouse growers. Yeah. I mean, indoor growers, you're getting similar climate and same usually PPFD, uh, energy to the canopy, CO2 levels. Everything's real similar every day. Um, with greenhouse, I mean, it's, it's fluctuating every day. Yep. So having that ability to, to change the dry back based on not just time, but based on um, water content mm-hmm. changes the game. I mean, literally saves hours of time for the grower. You know, hours. That's that's what we were we were trying to do here is is be a real useful tool. Yeah. yeah. So okay. the end goal is autopilot, obviously. Yeah. So, that's yeah. yeah that's what a, I want to. I want to talk about autopilot. In the large <laughs> facility, you know, you can imagine when there's you know, let's just say ten rooms, oh. eight zones per room. You got eighty timers or more than that. You got your P one and P two timers set up. So it's just eliminating that, looking at graphs. And adjusting timers. It's a full-time job for at least one person yeah. in a commercial facility to... And a stressful one. ...analyze yeah. graphs all day long, make the correct decisions, hope they're making the right decisions to alter the next day's events, and then they're constantly learning every single day, okay, well, I kind of messed up here. I wish I would have done this. Because this has a lot more data behind it um, and can shave off that time and labor, again, saving labor yep. um, in the facility. And accuracy. Yeah. You know, consistency. Yeah, instead of a week and, of trying to yeah. dial in your, your drybacks, you can get it done in a day or two. Kind of like Athena Pro line. You know, if you look at it, it's like you're taking a beginner grower and you're kind of making them a pro right off yeah. the get. You know, it's like it's it's you, you just follow the follow the program. Yeah. And that's that's the thing, you know, programs like this, um, or whatever, you know programs you want to follow like for your target set points we're not telling you how to grow here this is this is still we're not trying to tell you how to grow we will help you know give you our recommendations but yeah. if you're using another program that says like hey you want a three percent additional dryback and a six percent ramp up shot and a 20 percent dryback this is this is all up to the grower here you know you program in what you want to do and it will help you do that that's really cool you could take your precision irrigation guide learn and then go enter it, what you learned here right yeah. into the program. That's awesome. Exactly. That's awesome. You guys are changing the industry, man. Now let, let's move on to Blueprint. What, what is Blueprint? I'll grab this one. All right. So Blueprints are, you've heard crop re- or recipes. We, we're calling them Blueprints. Once again, we have to add P0, call something <laughs> different. Yeah. But, so Blueprint is a crop recipe. It's, it's everything that... Uh, you can pre-program everything. So it's all your climate data, your temp, humidity, CO2, your lights, your light level, maybe even spectrum, um, your irrigation events, your, your recipes. Even, and then now that we, we're adding even all the manual things that happen uh, throughout the crop cycle, like tasks and pruning and trimming and all that stuff. So uh, you pre-program all of this and over the entire crop cycle. So I'm like, weeks, week one, this is how I went on my all my set points, uh, then week two, or you can even go more granular, or you can even scale. I program week one, and it'll gradually over the day scale to week two. So you're pre-programming everything. Uh, the difference between recipes, like in a in a in another cultivation management platform, and blueprints in GrowLink are we use these to control everything. So you're pre-programming it, and it's controlling your environment to those parameters. Um, so we can probably pull this up too, but yeah, no. is it's, it could you, is it like copilot for climate? Um, no, it's really just not yet, n- not yet. Um, no, but that's yeah, the direction. That's right? the direction for okay. sure. So it's the beginning um, of copilot for climate. Yeah, before blueprints, a customer would have to go in each week and change their temperature. You, you weren't able to pre-program your entire crop cycle ahead of time. And so now you can pre-program everything, and then every week it'll automatically change to, to your set points. Humidity, right. 
your CO2, everything is automatically ramping up, changing, doing what it needs to do without right. having a user input on a schedule. Oh, I got to get back to the computer today. I got to change all my parameters. Well, right? just, I mean, if we look right here, you, you kind of have the weeks, I think, laid out or... Or you have right here, veg, I, I want my temperature to be between 72 and 82 yeah. flour. So this is say this could be four stages mm -hmm. that could be pre-programmed and automatically change without any That's amazing. interaction. So you can do that now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we could pre-program, what page is that? Um, it's like two, one. So you pre-build your climate recipe for an entire growth yep. cycle and then just hit go and it automatically changes week by week or however, whatever day period you have that changed on. Yep. And where it gets really cool is um, we just acquired a company called Flow Envy, which is your metric integration uh, all of your SOP building tasks. Uh, they even have some light manufacturing and sales in there. But now we're able to bring in all of your harvest data, your, your yields, uh, and lab data and all this, and attach it to that blueprint run. So now here's the blueprint, here's the recipe, here's the result I got, and now I can do constant improvement. So I can tweak it, improve it. Then the goal is to have co-pilot co saying, hey, you would have got, we're just not there yet on the climate side of things, yeah. but the, the Make idea recommendations for climate. is now we know the yield on this particular blueprint, we can look for anomalies and look through the data and figure out why and give you suggestions on how to improve it the next time you run that blueprint. Can you record a, a grow session, like say a, a, a grow cycle? Can you record that and save that as a blueprint? Um, if you're manually changing them week by yep. week and altering as you're building? Yeah, the way it works is you would still pre-program your basic blueprint, but every change you make throughout that crop cycle, we're recording. And at the end, you can choose to save it with all of the changes or choose what changes you want to save it with. Got it. So I absolutely crushed during this one. I had a lot of manual input during it, but it worked out really well. You don't have to remember every nope. little change you made. You can just hit just save. Just make those all part of my blueprint for the next time I run it. Oh. Um, now, the, the blueprint covers all climate aspects. Anything else other than climate? Like <clears throat> you're talking CO2, temp, humidity, PPFD? Yep. Anything else? Um, well, you'll be able to... You'll be able to start interacting yeah. with your... So um, I'm, I'm actually creating one right here for us so you can kind okay. of see. So <laughs> basically, I just did like a little test. I'm adding a stage of growth in. So we're doing the veg state, for example, like veg week one. Um, so it's like seven days. You choose what growth stage it's in. You set your environmental set points. Um, you got temp day temp, night temp, humidity day, humidity night, VPD, VPD, day, VPD, VPD night, CO2 lighting set points with the ability to do ramp ups. So like if you were trying to simulate a sunrise or sunset, you can do that here. You can change your light intensity of however much it's going to be. You, you're changing light intensity. Uh, you, you're connecting to the light controller. Yeah, because we, we like control that. everything. Yeah, yeah. You know? so, okay. so you'd be able to put that in. So now you have... Are you measuring PPFD? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you are. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that one wasn't set up that way. But yeah, we, we'll have a PAR sensor in the, okay. in the room. Perfect. Yeah, and then you would multiple. Just, you would go through and you know create you know veg week one, um, and you could make you know, veg week two. You could just keep and so forth. Yeah, yeah. just continue on with instead all of, of a like a, a zero through a hundred. If you have a, a par sensor in the room, can you set it at a PPFD level? So you can say I want to oh, be at twelve hundred. Sure, and it'll drive that to twelve. Yeah, which is more important in greenhouses because we we do light throttling in greenhouse. So if you have cloud cover coming over, mm -hmm. uh, we, you can make the decision to supplement it with lighting and, mm -hmm. and keep a constant PPFD nice. in the we'll greenhouse. Ramp them up and down. That's game changing. Yeah, you basically, it, it saves all your set points and it auto applies them. And to, your, to answer your question, it's, it's climate right now, but now with, uh, with the irrigation, precision irrigation, you'll be able to go in and put your set points that are in your co-pilot program right into your uh, blueprint. It'll be on So they'll, they'll work together. Yeah, that's what I was So I was that way you'll automatically change your set points, your irrigation set points over time. Because they'll need to change yeah. based on the climate. Yep. And then that's amazing. it's going to have to be backwards. That's what we're working on is the backwards compatibility right. because suggestions, you know, the AI is going to change up your set points. 
on and then your, it's on your co-pilot based exactly. on the information so from your blueprint. We just have to merge the two. So we're yeah. working on what is a really intuitive UI so it's easy to use. That's what we have. It all works. Yeah. We just got to figure out the best way. Really good yeah, user so, experience. So the blueprint, a grower can set in all their parameters of the climate, you know, from temp, CO2, everything, PPFD, and go all the way till last two weeks of flower where they want to drop the room to 68 degrees, mm -hmm. lower the lights, lower the CO2, and just kind of finish it off. Yep. That is amazing. And then it kind of gets even better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now, now you're, you're, you're putting your harvest data on it. So now I know what my results were from the particular blueprint run. And so the neat thing is if you have, let's just say you have two facilities and your, your coworker over here in the LA facility ran this particular cultivar and got this result. And now you want to run that cultivar in your facility. You both have GrowLink. You can just grab his blueprint, put it in your room and hit play. Oh, that's sick. If they let you. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is the same company. Oh, yeah. yeah that's, it's, it's a shareable file. You can download and send to somebody right. else. So if, like, the way our th stuff is set up is each facility has a, an instance, I guess, or a, a login. I, and then there's domain login. So the domain would be all my facilities within my... So if you're thinking of a large MSO, you know, each facility has its own account. And then the domain user connects them all together. So you can see what goes across all facilities. Can you export... A blueprint to a thumb drive for what if you wanted to share it with somebody if you're a consultant perhaps anything like that yeah. like, right now we don't share them outside of the same organization copy um you know in my head and i don't know if this would be well received or not i, I see someday where you could like if you have a friend or you know somebody else you could share your blueprint or maybe you have a breeder for instance, who's breeding genetics, and this is the yeah. best way to run my genetic. Let me give you my blueprint of how you run your room. This is how this genetic runs best on this irrigation strategy on this climate. And you could yep. take that on the thumb drive <laughs> with that cut would, and load it up. We'd probably just have a share button right in the app. Okay. Share, put in who you want to share it with and send it off to them. I mean, you really, what you could do is say if there's a large, say it's Jungle Boys, right? And Jungle mm -hmm. Boys... Um, has great growers all over the place, but there's some growers that are extra knowledgeable, like Roach, for example. He could set up GrowLink at Cudahy, you know, his spot, run GrowLink, figure out all those parameters for a year or two, build all that in, download it into Blueprint, all his co-pilot irrigation strategies, and then take all that and send it to his GrowLink plat platform in Florida. Right. And now they can download that building into all those parameters that he's been working on for a year or two in Los Angeles and have the same exact thing going on. In. And you're saying that's available already right now. That is within a company, within the same organization. Awesome. Yeah. So if, you're, yeah. if you're an MSO, you can share all your recipes yep. and all your blueprints across the entire it country. changes everything. Changes everything. Yeah, and so yeah. you can think over time, you're constantly improving them. They're, yeah. they're constantly like, yo, getting hey, better. I want to run the- I got the, some new blueprint shit for you right here. I'm going to say that to you right now. Yeah, exactly. That's oh, all, that's, dude. Yeah, that's exactly how it works. Um, I'd like to, I think it'd be really cool. I, I know a goal that we have is to, like that, the AI that we have for you know, Copilot, mm -hmm. turn that, make that also do environment and then make it do both. I was going to say, oh, that's yeah. the goal. That's, yeah. 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 my thought that's the was like, sure. what if you just bring your plants over from veg to flower and you do a slow ramp up, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're slowly increasing your CO2, you're slowly mm -hmm. increasing your PPFD. That's obviously going to change your transpiration rates on the plant. And so it's going to be hard right now, or maybe it isn't, I don't know, uh, for the AI to figure out what to do the next day. If you're constantly in changing your climate over, say, like a week long acclimation period, right? If you're if you're increasing your light and your CO two, obviously the plants are going to yeah. transpire differently. So it's not really going to be an apples to apples day by day. But if you brought in, it, it will. So that the way you're you're absolutely right. Like if if we had that copilot in there, they would definitely. It'd be better if they work synergetically together. They can absolutely. make way more predictive analysis. But the way it's designed now, outside factors don't matter. Okay. So, I mean, whether it was someone in the room just with a hose, just, you know, going crazy on random plants, all it looks at is data. It's just looking at data, data trends, and, and real-time data, you know, so, and making those suggestions. And since they change constantly, you know, it's like constantly updating every 24 hours, um, it, it 
wouldn't matter to the program, but it is a way to streamline it better by combining the two. Yeah, blueprints happen from customers just wanting to have their set points on a schedule. I just don't right. want to go in and change my temp every t- week. Yeah. You know, I just yeah. want to do it for you. So that, that was the, the simple idea of where it stemmed from. And then that's, and this is where we took it. The beautiful thing I think about is not having to remember, man, that one time I crushed that run. Mm-hmm. I want to do that again. What did I do differently? Got it. Just, got it just save it. That's, that's huge. It's got the co-pilot. It's got your irrigation strategy with your climate. That's the, it's got all the parameters done. Okay, big question, right? This is the big question. <laughs> Can we keep our own data? Do we have to share our data with you? Oh, with us? Yeah, do we, do we have control of our data? Like, does, if Jungle Boys wants to keep their data and they don't want to share it with a company that they, they might not trust, like whoever, right? Sure. Do you guys give the ability for Jungle Boys to keep their data? Um, so first, we don't aggregate data, right? We don't share data. You own your data. It is in our systems. We do use data to improve our systems internally. Um, the, the only way is there, is there is a way that you can run your own server. So you can run your own yeah, server you can and point, keep your own data. You can, everything's um, ran through our... Uh, like when you set up, set it up, you can actually put your server URL and you could run a server you own. And we have set that up in certain instances. So it doesn't okay. bounce to your cloud. Right. It's your private, it's your private uh, Data. database and yeah. APIs and everything that's just for you. We have set that up on occasion. So you can't Not very common, but we absolutely have, have okay. done it and can do it. Yeah. Because I know for some growers, you know, prolific growers or, you know, like it's a big deal. They want to keep their data. Yeah. You know, I think it's it's important. We we definitely don't share anyone's data though. Like no, we have yeah, we yeah, have super strict data yeah. pr- um, privacy but it's like, policies. If but you, some people imagine if you're like X Y Z grower, you're a very popular grower, and you spend fi- twenty years figuring out how you're going to cultivate this plant, and you have this new system in your building that that you're running it. And a company is going around showing people your data. Like it could be a sales guy. You can't control it, right? You can't control every employee in your business. And he's going to, yo, bro, like, look at this is XYZ grower. And this is how he's running his facility. And I'm not saying you would do yeah. that, but Hopefully I'm just not. saying <laughs> it's yeah. like, that it's, yeah. it could happen. Yeah. Hey, hey, bro, you want the Jungle Boy program? Let me send it to you here. <laughs> You first, know what I'm saying? First, we like, can't do that, and nobody in our company can do that. But, but I'm just saying, I, I get it that yeah. it, it could happen, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, and and it and it could be something you don't necessarily. I understand that you don't believe in that, and that 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 should never happen. Sure. But one of your employees goes off on a whim, has control of that database, and starts sending it out to X Y Z. You can't control every single employee, right? Right. But there's no way. I mean. There's no way for that to happen. They can't physically export a profile or data and, and apply it to a different. So that's why. Well, that's what, well, but, that's, that's what, <laughs> but that's what you just said. Blueprint was within the organization. Yeah, right? but that you can't take it and apply it to like if it was Jungle Boys's. Oops, sorry, if it was Jungle Boys's blueprint. I there's no way for any employee. I could. Pro- I, well, I'm not smart enough, but an engineer probably could. But take there's no out. way for an employee to grab either those blueprints or profiles or, or there's also the rules, algorithms, and all that we haven't even covered, and apply it to a different installer instance of our of our system. Yeah. Um, but there is a way. You know, we can just do a private server, like a, a, a private setup. server. They keep their own data. Yeah. And you don't have access to it. Yeah. That's even awesome that you guys have that option. Right. It's not, I mean, for us, it's, it's, you know, there's a higher cost of, of maintenance. Now when we do updates, we have to update multiple instances of our environment versus just a single cloud instance, but yeah. So you'd have to, if you had an update, you'd have to go update the server. We have to update every instant of, you know, each one of those servers Yeah, for each of those. Yeah. We've only done it twice in the history of rolling okay. where people have a private. Where yeah. Yeah. I, understand, I, understand, I understand it too. Yeah. You know, what about, what about our hobby growers, our home growers, our garage basements and bedrooms? Like, where are we at? We like, that's one thing that I think is a big deal. And I know they felt left out uh, when it comes to systems like these 
only being accessible to licensed facilities um, is unfortunate. And what are you guys doing about our hobby guys? Um, so all of our software is available to anybody. Okay. Um, this you. is available on the pit controller. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So you can do all your your co-pilot stuff with a uh, with our single little e pit controller. Everything right here. And anybody can buy that online. Yep. Readily available, licensed or not. Yep. So anybody can buy this. Yep. Awesome, dude. And that so, is great. And we're kind of going full circle. I mentioned that we were hydropods when we first started the company, and we had these wireless modules, and that was absolutely for the home grower, hobby grower, and then. I, I think to sustain, you know, for us to sustain the business, we had to, we couldn't figure out how to successfully um, market to that base. And I think we were just early to market. I think if we hung out for a couple more years, like kind of when Trollmaster came in, we, we could have done well in that space. So we went way commercial on our hardware, you know, so, uh, and those were big UL control panels. I mean, just us building those panels was really expensive. And so it's kind of, cost per you know kind of cost or it priced out some of the you know a home grow or the or the hobby grows and now we're coming full circle so now we launched the pick controller which is a product you can buy on our website that's um what works for commercial grows and home uh the new connect controller is another step there uh so the old controller was the core that was the that we installed in the big panels the connect controller is the same power and brain of the core but it has all the built-in input, inputs and outputs. Uh, so all of your, your analog drivers for your lights, your, re your relays for your valves and your HVAC and all this kind of stuff. It's still hardwired in, so it's not quite as easy, I guess, to install as like those little wireless modules or outlets. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to talk um, more about the Kinect controller. I think that's a yeah. Yeah. game-changing piece that? of equipment Enjoyment. in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's really we came out with it to lower our hardware cost. Um, I, I have a problem. I always say we make panel shops. We don't build our own panels. We contract them out. And that's the biggest cost of our solution today is the actual assembly of these panels. It's not the individual components in the panel. It's the labor to wire those panels up. And so um, the Connect controller just brings that all into a single, single board. So all your inputs and outputs and everything are on a single board. So there's not a ton of wiring and assembly. Um, we're able to, to build those put them in like a poly case, pre-assemble them, put them on the shelf and ship out orders. So if you think about the core controller, our big commercial, those are all custom built. Every single one of those. And what's the average lead time on a core controller? Probably like three months. Three months versus something now that you can just get off the shelf. Go to, yeah, go to our website and buy it and we'll ship it. And so it's really going to allow us to scale. The other controller, there's tons of engineering. We're working with electrical engineers and and consultants and we're working them throughout the entire install process and we're doing design drawings and 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 we're supporting the trades like the electricians and everybody uh installing the product and then we land our guys on site to do the commissioning and training of those systems so it's a it's really heavy it's like a heavy lift every single one of those deals and so the core controller comes with a thick manual teaches you how to wire it all yourself um is available on our website um and at a at a much lower cost or price. Let's talk about price on that real quick and how it compares in the market. Yeah, the controller itself, and we now we sell just the controller too. So if you want to hang it right on the wall, you could. If you want to put it in your own cabinet, you can. Uh, it starts at nineteen ninety nine for just the controller, um, and it's. I and mean, we just had a bundle where for thirty nine ninety nine, you could get the controller plus two climate sensors and two substrate sensors. So that kind of gives you an idea on in the on enclosure, with in the enclosure, transformer, and everything. power supply, everything. And, and so in that, that case, that, that that's a sale we're having. I mean, that, that goes up to about forty nine ninety nine when okay. it's not on sale. So five grand that gets you substrate, climate, and the controller in an enclosure with all the yep. power you need to. And it has you know it has sixteen outputs, so that's uh, either sixteen valves, HVAC, CO two. You, know, you can connect any any on off mm -hmm. kind of device. Anything that's twenty four volt. Or how does um, it? Right. So the line voltage stuff, you'll have to run through a relay. Okay. Uh, and then there's eight analog outputs, and these are light drivers. So you can have eight zones of lights or anything else you want to uh, run with a zero to 10 volt analog like signal. speed, any of that. Yep. So so for, for about five grand, 
a home grow could be off to the races running co-pilot. That's everything. That's everything. For less than that. I mean, that's if, you know, that, that would be like two zones of climate. Well, okay. So, or you're averaging them, I guess. Right. No, you home don't grow, I don't think you need the average. <laughs> one sensor is probably fine. Yeah. You could bring that cost down pretty significantly. Yeah. And then you have a commercial solution in a home grow at a very reasonable price. Yeah, I mean, this is an industrial IoT controller. It's it's not, I mean, it's beefy. And, <laughs> it's going to And so last. They, they have access to now use Blueprint and Copilot. Everything. At a home grow with how, how expensive, say if they have a one eight light room or 16 lights or something like that. So, um, how on expensive, like equipment, the software? no or, equipment is like what about 2,500 to three grand. I think, right. A little over three grand probably okay. for the single sensor. And, and we were talking uh, about earlier, sensor substrate. density is going to be the driving cost of what yep. that is. So how many substrate sensors, like the, the controller sounds like is around like the low $3,000 mark in the enclosure with the yep. power supply and everything. And then you get the climate sensor at 700 bucks. Uh, so you're at four grand there and then just how many the, substrate sensors you want to use. Yep. Um, and okay. So that's that, the, the, in my opinion, it's really affordable. Yeah. Uh, especially since it's coming with copilot and blueprint and you have access to the software, but how much is the subscription for the software and how does that work? Yeah. So it's a, it's a point based. And so maybe I'll describe a point. So point is any input or output, right? So, a CO2 valve would be a point, right? I'm turning it on and off. It's one point. Uh, a climate sensor, if it had temp, humidity, and CO2, that's three points. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like any kind yeah, of, yeah. Any, every data we're collecting or any output we're collecting. Um, and it's all around, it's on the website. I don't know what the most recent pricing is. Uh, um, it, it's all around, it, uh, our latest pricing is around a dollar something a point so if you think about that the, the connect controller has 16 outputs and and there you go eight yeah but that's that's per device point uh, points are cheaper so the new price it's 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 very reasonable i've yeah, seen i've seen the, 20 some for that home grow i mean yeah, it's under grow, 20 bucks under 20 bucks a month, a month. Dude, that's yeah. okay all day. Now, the way it gets expensive is when you have 500 sensors and you have you know, 500 climate sensors and Even tons still, of zones. your subscription of- model is very reasonable. I've seen on very large facilities a monthly bill that is not staggering at all. It's based on our – we have a per point cost, cloud cost. Yeah. And it's based on a multiple of that for us to support that and, and run that. It's not based on we're going to increase your yields by – yeah. <laughs> we're gonna increase your yield yeah, by ten yeah, percent. So we want half of that, <laughs> yeah. you know, or or even or even uh, by the square foot or something like that. It's literally based on a markup of our actual cost to support that controller in the cloud. Right? Yeah, no, hundred percent. No, that's that's super reasonable. I see uh, eight sixteen light grows spending you know thirty nine bucks a month to have access to Copilot and Blueprint. Uh, all day, bro. Like mm-hmm. we are, we are, we are playing. Like, let's go. Yeah, and we're, we're always working on trying to bring our those the cloud costs down too. You know, I mean, that's a constant battle. Yeah, it's it super cool. It's <laughs> it super cool. Trying to collect more are, and more data, and, and, yeah. and it's not super have the cool what run. you guys are doing, and you're not cannabis taxing. Like, it's yeah, I've heard that a big term. deal. Yeah. It's a big deal, and we like at Athena, we we got the same philosophy. We don't just want to be fair and um and and not take advantage of of the industry so respect on that thank you yep thanks what are your thoughts on putting this in the international market the connect controller um that's another neat thing about it is we can scale with it and go international with it um it already supports all the voltages and and you can get the different plug types uh, we're working on a uh, certification just in certain countries getting it in. Uh, you need like CE certification for Europe and stuff. And so, yeah. And then then we would have to potentially localize the software as well. Right. So for, for me, we're breaking into the international market with Demeter. And a lot of our designs, we have complex valving and we like to use motorized ball valves from Imperium. Uh, with these devices and everything, it's really hard in the international market to find a controller that's going to work properly with our systems we design. So we've had to previously kind of dumb down our systems and having a controller like this internationally 
would be a is massive needed. benefit for us and the growers, right? Yeah. Yeah, really? we're shipping it. I mean, you can buy it on our website and we're shipping it worldwide right now. Awesome. And same thing with the PIC controller. The PIC controller has all the certifications already. It's just, we're, takes, we just launched the Connect controller, what, a week ago? Two mm-hmm. weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so they're coming. Yeah, yeah they're already a, Applied for him what, and working on it. Do you have any languages that you're working or that you've converted to on your u- interface? Not yet. No. Okay. I'd recommend Spanish right away. Thai. Thai. Thai right is away. a big one. Yeah. Thai, because yeah. Thailand is it's a pretty big market. And um, I think it's like the foundation of Asia. Yeah. So, we're doing a few jobs, even with the large commercial stuff. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Going over there, yeah. Yeah. I oh, you're that. sending core uh, controllers to Thailand already. Yeah. Wow. Which is not ideal. Like right. th- that's why I, I like the Connect controller. I like the price point. I think it's more. It's better priced. Um, but it also, like I said, we just ship it anywhere. Versus for us to scale the company international with the core controllers and the panels, we have to find panel shops in mm-hmm. all these different countries. Find people that can you know do the assembly and support. We're also crazy about support like we want to be careful going outside the u.s to make sure that we can provide the same level yeah. of support that we do here 100 percent um you know uh, this comes from customers you know our plants don't sleep so you guys yeah. need to answer the phone 24 yeah. 7 yeah. yeah and so being able to support that um is important to us yeah great yeah you'd be surprised what you could get done with chat gpt like we did translations, <laughs> <laughs> like oh, yeah. dude, it works fantastic. Yeah, like yeah. we did translations on our booklet that we're working on, and we sent it off to you know we did Albanian and uh, uh, we sent it off to an Albanian guy that that was a grower, and he was like, well, "There's two changes in the whole book," and I'm like, "Whoa, great job!" And so huh. I mean, yeah. not too bad. At the- and the we're a everything we're a Microsoft Azure shop so you know our our cloud is microsoft azure our controllers are called edge devices they're running microsoft iot all the ai stuff's microsoft ai so that's what's the in the background of it nice and it su- already supports the portal supports the uh, multi you know localized uh languages we just have to translate it and put it in there so i don't think the lift is too hard yeah 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 um, on to, you know, you, you guys made some changes with your substrate monitoring sensor. Can you guys talk about the differences in what yeah. your new TerraLink is? Yeah, it's not something we wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. like, like, I, I, we're, you know, we're a software company. At, at the end of the day, I say we're a software company that happens to sell a lot of hardware, and we've had to build certain things at times when we couldn't find something out there that um, already existed and like the connect controller there's no all-in-one controller you can just connect everything to that we could have bought and put our firmware on right so we had to build it and so um we've been at this for eight years growing's been around eight years we've been doing substrate monitoring and valve control off substrate data for at least six and and we used to um, we used to sell, you know, the, the, the popular solution that's out there uh, ex- exclusively with all of our, you know, PIC controllers and for all of our substrate monitoring. Um, that sensor what, wasn't available to us anymore <laughs> at, at some point. Um, and so that's when we looked for another manufacturer. And so we found the, uh, the Aclima TDR sensor. And that sensor has um, worked out really well, but since the audience... You know, our, our customer base was used to how a capacitance sensor, I, I mean, basically the Terrace 12. Yeah, could you, <laughs> yeah. Well, could you? Meter Groups has done a great job on getting that sensor out to market. And that's kind of the, the gold standard, right? I mean, that's... Yeah, that's, but what, what's the main difference between a TDR and yeah. a capacitance? Because those are the two different choices when you have substrate monitoring, right? And right, right. So it's, what are the big differences between TDR and um, capacitance? I can't really dive into the electronic yeah. details, though. It's just two different ways of measuring a wavelength between those rods. You know, you're in, uh, the main difference that the user would notice, right, on, on water content, very similar readings. Um, however, on EC, the, the 
the capacitance sensor is actually an equation between the reading that they get and the and the water content. So it's called a hill horse, uh, right? Yeah, hill horse equation. Hill horse equation. <laughs> um, and so it, it just does math to try and figure out the, uh, the EC, and it's influenced by water content, where the TDR sensor actually reads EC and the, the ma- and and water content separate. Um, so at we still feel like the TDR sensor provides a, a more real EC. And let me explain what um uh, I, here's the example I get. Let's just say you soak a rock wool cube in three EC solution completely, and you put a probe in it and you read it. it should read three EC, right? And it would at 100 percent or whatever 50 percent, whatever it reads. You know, if a fully saturated cube would read three EC. Then I always tell people to put a wet dry vacuum on it suck out, suck it, all the moisture out until it's down to like 30, the EC should still be three, right? Well, no, because, <laughs> no, because your, your water content went lower. The EC in that water hasn't changed. Well, if, uh, the map, oh, the, be, this, okay, this is for see, specific, okay. specific example. Yeah. Like, yeah, no yeah. plants involved. So this, that, this is because the plants, the plants are eating the salt. Yeah. No, but this the, is the, the difference. The nutrients. This yeah. is the difference. The okay. a climate sensor would probably uh, would read somewhere around three EC still, but with that uh, with that equation, the capacitance sensor using that equation, you know, it was reading three is probably going to you know whatever goes up to six. Gonna, and so that's what everyone's used to. So mm-hmm. that was the big problem about selling the TDR sensor over the capacitance. Everyone wanted our data to match the capacitance sensor. And so that's, that's one of the main drivers of why uh, we moved over and, and found a contract manufacturer to, to make our own uh, capacitance. capacitance sensor. So that way it's... Because even in here, you're referencing... The capacitance capacitance numbers. Yeah, yeah. So if if yeah. you were trying to hit a six EC with the TDR sensor, that's uh, that's probably a 13, 14, 15 EC on a capacitance. So we just the industry's used to capacitance. So so pretty much the 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 industry sta- standard is a capacitance sensor. Yeah. And so you you kind of forced to, yeah. Hundred percent. It was either take tons of calls and go through what I just no, said and try and explain to everybody, yeah. or just join them. Right? Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> and when the TDR two does have trouble at high ECs, um, it can it kind of shorts out the equation. So when you, if you're running really high EC, you can start getting um, missing data, like where it'll miss data for a while. That was something else we found with that. Now, with your new, with your with your brand new capacitance sensor, is there like a recommendation on placement inside Rockwell? Do you have that on your website, or is yeah. there like a tool you use? It, it's the exact same as the TDR. It's, it's exactly what you have in here too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Same as the Teros. Okay. So depending on substrate size, you're either going to go, you know, an inch from the bottom, two inches from the bottom, or three inches from the bottom. Okay. or anything in between. Really what it is, is with any of these probes, I'm sure you guys know, it's like if you move that probe down, uh, the reading is going to go way higher. You know, you're... you're right. Yeah, because you're going to have way higher on water content. Yeah. Yeah, but EC will be... Well, Depending on how much concentrated salts you have down yeah, in yeah. that area yeah. Yeah. will change. But same thing, you move it up higher, uh, it's going to get lower water content reading. You just got to find that middle ground that works, yeah. which you have recommendations. What yeah. do you think about our uh, sensor placement recommendations that we put on our new SOP that we're about to come out with? So we, I think we did a little light on the sensor count, but what we kind of explained here on some of these um, position places yeah. is you know, based on where the plant is inside on the tray or inside the garden, you could have a fan right in front of some plants, which you'll have a mm-hmm. lower water content based on the plant that's across the aisle, right? Oh, mm-hmm. And on the center, the center aisle of the plants on the same tray, you would have a higher water content because they're not drying out as fast. Um, and... So, you know, we kind of did a baseline across sensor placement of across all plants that, you know, plants that are in front of fans, center plant, and plants on the opposite side of fans, essentially. 
what do you think? Do you have any recommendations for us? Because mm-hmm. you know, you guys are making the equipment and. Oh, oh you want me to go? Yeah. I, you'll you need to just follow. Um, every facility is different first. And so yeah. trying to find exactly what those microclimates are or off of a single illustration, I think is tough. But if you do spot checks, right. Okay. You, I think you can spot check your row and figure out where you should place permanent sensors that are driving uh, automation. Right. I, I always tell people sensor density is a very important factor. Trying to drive an entire room off of just a couple sensors is not going to yeah. work. Um, if you're on different strains, that strain needs to have a couple sensors for each one. Or in a zone, you need to have a couple sensors in that one zone. You don't have to go every single plant by any means. But being able to grab an average off of a few sensors, maybe you had a bad placement when you got put in. There was an air pocket around it. Um, yeah. And now if you're driving your entire room or that entire zone off of that one sensor that was improperly installed, you're going to have less than desirable results, right? Yeah. So sensor density and making sure we're grabbing an average off of at least two or three sensors per zone, I think is, is a very important thing to have. Yeah, absolutely. We, we always, I, I anyway, I always recommend like a minimum of one sensor per 100 square feet of canopy. So if you had like a 50 foot row, that'd be two sensors at the bare minimum. Um, in terms of placement on here, you know, you're absolutely right with how they dry yeah. out faster, like on the corners and, and depending on where the ACs are and the ducts are in the rooms. Um, I always basically will tell people, like, you always want to go, like, say we're just going to look at a 50-foot row here. Um, you want to go, like, a quarter or a third of the way in on one side, a third of the way in on the other side. Um, I don't like to go, like, pure in the middle because then basically what it comes down to is you don't want to cater to in a row you're always going to have like 70 percent of the plants are going to be roughly around the same if it's a monocrop you know and then 15 percent might be too wet and 15 percent might be too dry we just don't want to get into a situation where we have a probe in either of those 15 percenters you know we do not want to cater to the outlier there um, because the most of the yield is going to come from the 70 percent so what i always recommend is you know go a third way third of the way in here third of the way in there on either end and then like you said, do spot checks, not necessarily with a probe, the old, the old fashioned way, get in uh, there, pick yeah, it up real quick. Up. And if you basically, so I'll go in and I'll see, okay, there's a sensor in this specific cube or this specific pot. Um, I know what the readings are. That plant looks healthy. You know, I'll pick it up, feel the weight, and then I'll pick up a couple around it in that general area that that probe is representing. And if they all feel around the same, I'm good. I won't touch it. But if I pick that plant up and I and after checking all the ones around it, and it's like, oh, this one's like way lighter, then I'm going to move it to one that is a better representation of that average. So. Regarding um, cocoa, you know, I've, I've heard of guys getting kind of real inconsistent readings based on the, the denseness or how compact the cocoa is um, in sensor readings. Um, what is your recommendation on putting sensors into cocoa and, and is there like a guidance or SOP on, on how to make sure to get a proper reading that's consistent? There's multiple ways. Um, you know, the way we talked earlier, you know, you were saying that you guys actually will like put it in as you're packing, you know, packing the cocoa initially before a transplant. That's a pretty good way. I would say the other way to do it would be you know, after the transplant is done, which is what I typically would do, and after it's been thoroughly wet, you know, so that way the cocoa has a chance to compact itself down um, with the water. Mm -hmm. And also that way when you put it in, it's not going to like indent the side too hard of wherever you're stabbing through because it's already been compacted. It has like a high volume of water in it already. Um, And then usually when you water after that, once the probe has been inserted, it's going to fill in all those gaps as well. And push the cocoa down, down again. But if you're getting inconsistent readings, it's maybe check your compactness on the cocoa and maybe compact around where just the sensor is, would you say? Or Yeah, I mean, I guess it, it really just depends on what type of cocoa you're using and what kind of inconsistencies you're getting. Like, I know I've had them, we were, again, talking about earlier. It's like I've had issues with quick fills where they look hydrated all the way Mm -hmm. um but at the end of the day like when you if you were to like tear it open there's still little thin layers in there that have not been rehydrated they're still super hydrophobic and they're like rock solid if you just so happen to get unlucky and stab a sensor into that that's going to cause some major inconsistencies there you usually can tell because it's a little crunchy Mm -hmm. when you go to push it in Mm -hmm. 
I've also heard that it's it's beneficial. I mean, if not every garden is going to be perfect, not every plant's going to be optimum health, but overall, you what I've heard is you want to put the sensor in the plants that are the most healthiest. Is was that true, or do you, do you do you have any opinion on that? My personal opinion, I'm still going to go with the majority because we want to make the majority the healthy ones. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I've seen a lot of situations where the driest plant looks the best. You know, it's blasted the hardest. Um, In that scenario, though, if I've catered to that dry plant, I'm going to overwater the rest of my plants at that point. So, again, it's, it's really, you know... Yeah, most of the time, the driest plant looks the healthiest in your garden. I mean, that's what yeah. I mm-hmm. usually see. So find kind of one that's in the middle to put your sensor in. Yeah, because if, if, uh, if you pick one that's like in the middle and then you say, all right, let's, let's dry them out a little bit more, now you can make the rest of them look like that because they'll become drier. Gotcha. Just my opinion, though. Hey, Brandon, it's... 15 you, after 12. You got to go. You got a flight. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. I'll be hey, running through the airport run. today. How yeah. long do we go? I think it was like two, three hours. What? Just over two? It's not too shabby. Yeah. Pretty good. No. Um, this was awesome. I mean, Marcus could probably stick around and no, talk, no, talk well, more with you guys. But. I think we're pretty wrapped up. I mean, no, we'll, yeah, we'll let you go. All right. <laughs> and we'll, maybe we'll, we'll keep talking with Marcus. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for having me out. Dude, this I is appreciate fun. it. This is cool. Yeah. Appreciate, I appreciate everything it. you guys are doing. And uh, we'll, yeah. We'll keep plugging away at it. Yep. We like to, I always say we like to build cool things that people enjoy using. That's part of it, yeah. right? That yeah. have a positive impact on their business. Yeah. That's kind of the rules. I'm like, does it, do they like to use it? <laughs> is it helpful? Yeah. And then does it have, you know, help them with their outcome? So. Yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate your time. All right. See ya. See ya. Thanks, Dad. Yeah. Okay, going into your guys' fertigation skid, why do you use H.E. Anderson? Well, H.E. Anderson is uh, one of the most reliable skids out there. They they offer one of the most reliable pumpers that that is seen in the industry. You know, and we've used quite a bit in the past. Like, we used to use... Seiko pumps, editrons, you know, all, all, all sorts of stuff. And it wasn't necessarily anything wrong with any of them. Um, it's just for a lot of our larger commercial customers, they they needed something that had that more robustness and, and could stand up to that just constant, you know, dosing all day long. And um, H.E. Anderson, you know, fit that bill. So, How do you find the accuracy on H.E. Anderson compared to do- other dosing systems? I think they're honestly really, really accurate. Um, you know, they've got those dials on the top that can be, so like you, first off, you size a specific pump for what nutrient you're trying to use. Mm-hmm. You know, so like a, I think they have three or four different sizes, a pH, you know, if that's what you're dosing or some sort of micronutrient that you only need a small amount on, um, you're going to select a smaller pump. And then once you have that pump size, that's you know, s- suitable for that range, you have a dial on there that can go down to between one and 10. And you can go into half spaces and, and everywhere in between. And basically what that's adjusting is the actual uh, pump volume, you know, as it goes out. So I was on site yesterday uh, in Ohio with one where we were commissioning it. And the accuracy and the speed of setup was pretty incredible. Um, I mean, we spec them all day long in our builds. Uh, I don't often get a chance to get hands on with them. Um, yesterday, I spent a lot of time configuring and rebuilding the the core controllers going through pretty much every GrowLink offering uh, in the last couple of days. Um, and on that Anderson skid, our initial setup of it was so fast um, with insanely high accuracy in a matter of minutes. I mean, we went through and we tested all the pumps and calibrated them to make sure that... Uh, they were in fact injecting properly. And then we built some recipes real quick in the computer and fired them off and they were within 0.05 EC immediately. Was it like for a small grower, is it user-friendly, like as simple as a dosatron or more complicated? In different ways, right? A dosatron is going to be more cost-effective for sure. I mean, it's going to be probably a quarter of the price to set up a four recipe system on dosatron. Uh, versus an Anderson skid. Anderson's, I would say, is for the larger facilities. Um, 
not so much like if you're 25,000 square feet or under, you got to have a pretty big budget to, to go Anderson. And that's where Dosatron really makes sense. And then pairing it with like a connect controller to manage your climate and your irrigation. Right. But, uh, if you go to those larger scale facilities, it just makes more sense to go to a smart dosing system especially if you have multiple recipes above the traditional four Athena recipes, right? If you're a grower that likes to tinker with things and you want to have a three EC, a three and a half EC, a two and a half, a two, a one, Mm -hmm. uh, multiple veg recipes, right? To do that with Dosatron is going to take an amazing amount of wall space, right? You're going to have to build a rack for every single one of those recipes or you're going to have to be tuning them and manually adjusting them as you change the recipe. Whereas Anderson, you can just go in or Anderson pumpers with a growing panel rather, you can just go in and build all those recipes and a four by eight panel on the wall can build you an endless amount of recipes. So in that regard, they are simpler. There's no hand adjustment on them after they're calibrated. It's literally going into a laptop and saying, I want this many mils per gallon of this, this many mils per gallon of this, go. This is my target EC, my target pH. Um, So you would say anything under 25,000 I mean, that's kind of hard to say, right? I've, I've had just, facilities that are, I, I, we just did one recently. It's two flower rooms and a bedroom and they put an Anderson skid in there. Okay. Uh, so it's just, just what your customer. budget is, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but in the large scale facilities, you need an intelligent dosing system like this. Yeah. You don't need one, but it, there's a great benefit to it. Yeah. And the reliability. I mean, we, I was with Anderson, uh, during a trade show uh, a couple weeks ago at Cultivate and we were talking about them and they, they have customers that have these out in the field uncovered for 15 plus years and they're still operating perfectly. No maintenance or no maintenance on these things. Whoa. That, that's why we went with them. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Direct sunlight in the field for 15 years. No maintenance. Nothing. Oh God. And you can That's run them nice. off of water power, not just air power. So they're in an indoor grow. We typically hook up an air compressor to them. The big field guys, they just run water through them, and they can be water powered pumpers as well. Oh shit! Yeah, it's it's big time. Yeah, yeah. Um, Marcus, what what are the benefits of of you of GrowLink working with Demeter Designs on with customers? The customer experience, at the end of the day, like those designs, it's just super easy. And Colton's told, he says this all the time. He's like, you know, there's nothing like giving the customer what you provide, which is that, that full virtual walkthrough, the full cut sheets, just everything. I don't get that anywhere else. Yeah. Have you ran into some designs that have kind of been business detriment to the business, you know, irrigation designs that aren't properly done? Cause I've, I've seen it quite a few times. It's like, they go in, they want us to fix a lot of their problems, but it's like, we've got to change the irrigation to even do that. You're saying, do we run into that? Have you run into that? Yeah, like out in facilities field. that oh. haven't used us. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. All the time. A lot. Yeah. yeah. A lot. It's like, um, <clears throat> facilities are hiring co- plumbing contractors to install complex irrigation systems that none of them ever grown weed before or, or have extensive experience. I think that's what sets it, really sets it apart. It's, it's unfortunate when we get that, we have that initial conversation with a potential client and we go through the consultation, we give pricing, and then we don't hear from them for a while and we get that unfortunate call six months, a year later, hey, we didn't want to spend the money with you. We hired our local plumber. It's not working out. We're having tons of issues. Can you please redesign our system for us? And now they just spent double the amount of money. Has that, happen, has that happened often? It's happened Al- quite a few times. Almost every job. Almost every job. <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit of exaggeration, but, but a, a lot. It's a lot. Very, very frequent. Yeah. Where guys come back and they're like, hey, sorry, I ghosted you. Could you help us out? Shit. Yeah. They're spending a lot more than... Yeah. I mean, PVC is expensive these days. Plastics went through the roof during... COVID and all that, uh, schedule 80 is not cheap by any means. And so gutting an entire facility because it wasn't specced properly and from the get go, and then not to mention you're now an actively growing facility. So you have yeah. to manage a retrofit My God. during an active grow 
versus getting it done right from the jump. Like, let's just get this done right. When there's no plants in the building, we can tune the system, we can calibrate, we can work through all the kinks versus having, okay, staff, hey, I know we had an irrigation system before. We no longer have that because it never worked that well anyways. Have fun hand watering for the next two months Mm. while we gut everything and rebuild it. I think it goes back to exactly what you guys are doing here with crop steering 1.0 and moving into co-pilot and 2.0. We have to remember that all this shit's new. Mm-hmm. Like we weren't growing in 50,000 square foot commercial warehouses, um, anything but cannabis. And so all you know, people or contractors or plumbing contractors or any contractor trying to get into the industry is like, yeah, you know, I can, let me see, I can build that. You know, yeah. it's just like, they haven't done it before. And when you have like you guys, we learn from our mistakes. And I think that's as growers, I think, you know, we're constantly learning from, from mistakes and part, you know, with you guys at Demeter, you've learned from a lot of mistakes. We're still learning. It's yeah. not over. I mean, what I was doing two years ago is different than what I'm doing today. It's not saying that those designs are bad or they don't work, but we found ways working with cultivators and some of the best growers in the country, how to make things better and more efficient for the new cultivators that we're putting up, right? Yep. Um, we're constantly taking what we've done on previous jobs and adapting that to a new scenario for that new client. Every build is different. It's not, we just have one cookie cutter recipe that goes for everybody. Every build is designed for that customer specifically, for their growing style, for their needs. Some maybe has some facilities maybe only want to water two zones at a time. Some buildings want to water four massive rooms at a time. Some people want to have two recipes, three recipes. Some people want to have eight, right? So everything is different. The fertigation systems are different. The zoning is different. It's, I wish it was more cookie cutter, be a lot easier for me. Yeah, yeah. But uh, getting to do this, a new job every single time, gives us the ability to improve upon it. Yeah. Right. hundred percent. No, I appreciate you guys coming out. Um, you know, everybody at this table seems to have the same philosophy um, as far as where we come from, you know, and what we believe in, um, you know, with, with Demeter, with GrowLink, Athena, like we, we all have the customer's interest in mind. You know, we want to drive success. Um, we want to share what we what we learn, you know, and learn from our mistakes and become better. Um, it's it's nice to work with and alongside, you know, partners like like you guys. So I appreciate you guys making the trip out, and uh, thanks for your time. I appreciate appreciate you having us out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks, for sure. man.